Nice. So let me Got start. It. Hearing. Oh, wait, my computer. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yeah, very good. <laughs> nice. So thanks for the introduction. I'm Juno Lee from Robotic Systems Lab. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about our recent works on applying deep learning or deep reinforcement learning to make uh, make this guy walk, make this four-legged robot called animal walk. So my main research topic is to make this guy walk over all kinds of different terrains like this. <clears throat> and we have found out that combining RL or deep learning techniques into our framework really helps making it more robust over large like random terrain in the real world. And now we are at the level where we can go hiking with this robot dog in ARPS. And yeah, this was not possible with our previous controller, which is based on, oops, which is based on model-based optimization. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm going to talk about what was the bottleneck of our conventional approach, the conventional model-based approach, and how these data-driven approaches helped overcoming them. So yeah, let me first explain the problem. Like actually making this robot walk is really a difficult problem. Like firstly, the dynamics is highly nonlinear. Like when you make steps, like <clears throat> when you switch the context of the foot, the system dynamics changes discreetly. The dynamics depends largely on which feet are in contact. And this is very hard to model mathematically. And there are so many different possible walking patterns for these four-legged robots. Like there can be many different, different combinations and different timings. And this is really hard to solve online on the robot. And secondly, when the robot is walking, like there are many different forces acting on it, like ground reaction force and disturbances from payload, gravity, and some disturbances from obstacles. And under this like situation, the robot has to like satisfy several competing objectives and constraints. It has to balance, it has to make use of ground reaction force to move forward, it has to reject disturbances, it has to like satisfy hardware limits. So yeah, walking is a really difficult, complex, nonlinear optimization problem. So how did people, how have people solved this? It's like, so one of the most like common approaches to decompose it into sub problems or different levels. For example, you first generate walking motion using trajectory optimization or some heuristic like rules. And here you generate like walking pattern and the, like base trajectory, reference trajectory. And then on the robot, you follow it using uh, controllers that are aware of the rigid body dynamics of the robot itself. We call it whole body controller. <clears throat> and I think in this second part, we have quite well established knowledge in our field. We can make the robot balance while rejecting disturbance and we can make it walk, like follow the reference trajectories. But for the first part, I think it's quite still quite challenging, like solving for this contact sequence and generating this full body trajectory is usually really hard, like really computationally expensive for this robot with many degrees of freedom. <clears throat> and people usually simplify this problem like problem to improve convergence and improve computation time. But this often makes the solution infeasible on the real robot. So what people do to solve this big problem on this small robot's brain is to simplify the problem. So if you see the famous spot for animal, if, if you see them walking, they make really regular walking pattern. This is because people already handcrafted this pattern to simplify the problem. And there are several assumptions like the contact only occurs at the feet and the terrain is like static and rigid. And the controllers only perceive the world in a very simple representation, like binary contact state, like if the foot is contact or not, and some approximation of the terrain. <clears throat> and this simple problem can be efficiently solved on the robot and they generalize quite well on many different robots. But the thing is, there can be many corner cases where these assumptions and simple perception is not enough. Like for example, when you take the robot near the riverside and when the robot walks over this soft terrain, the stance, the ground, change, ground shape changes as the robot steps on it. And then the foot is not stationary anymore. 
the assumption breaks. And sometimes the optimization server just diverges and the robot falls over. <laughs> and another problem is that a bigger problem is in this perception, actually. It's like when we take the robot to this like random forest, this interaction between the foot and the ground is really complex. It slips, the terrain crumbles, and there are many deep, like complex like interactions are happening. But this simple binary representations, they cannot represent all these complex behaviors. <clears throat> so this sort of corner cases happen because they we simplify the problem by a lot. And we re usually resolve this problem by adding a reactive controllers, which is basically a set of if statements. And if you engineer it, if you do a very good engineering on this part, you get a very robust controller like Boston Dynamics. <clears throat> And this part is what we want to remove using data-driven method because distinguishing different pattern and acting on different pattern is what neural network is really good at. So yeah, now, yeah, let's talk about our works. So we've been working on these two aspects to reduce this assumption and improve the, to get the richer perception of the world. So by using model-free RL, we remove these assumptions on the controller design. <clears throat> and so we train a neural network control policy in the simulation using model-free reinforcement learning to generate motion considering the full dynamics of the system. And this neural network controller is usually very efficient to run on the robot because it's only like two or three layers MLP. And secondly, we used sequence model like TCN or RNN <clears throat> to replace these like handcrafted features. So we learn a latent representation, representation and used it instead of this conventional contact detector or slip detector. And then we could make the robot more robust and more adaptive to various rough terrains. So let's talk about the first work. So we started using RL to generate motions for our like walking motions for our robot. And as you know, like RL is really data hungry. And if you want to train something on the real robot, it can be really costly. Like it will take a lot of time and it might damage the robot, which is really expensive. So <clears throat> we, what we, so our direction was to develop a realistic simulation of our robot animal and train a policy using the simulated data and run it on the real robot. So in this work, we developed this very, accurate simulator of our robot. And as you can see in this comparison video, <clears throat> yeah, the simulation matches the real world quite well. And what we achieved with this approach was that we could uh, like replace this whole optimization stack in this locomotion controller with a neural network that takes robot state as input and outputs the joint position command. And as this neural network controller, neural network policy is like not bound to any simplified assumption or simplified model, we can generate like many new complex motions like this. So <clears throat> if you see this guy rolling on the ground, this robot actually makes a lot of contact with the ground. And if you were going to do this with the conventional method, you had to design where the contact occurs and at which timing the contact occurs. And this kind of motion was really like new using, and we could achieve this using model free RL. <clears throat> and yeah, the biggest challenge in this work was this discrepancy between the simulation and the real world. Like if you use, usually if you train something in this physics engine and run it on the robot, it usually just fails like this. <clears throat> So it does very weird shaky motions on the robot. This is because there are many delays or frictions inside the robot, like in between the joints and everything, and which is not simulated by our physics engine. Like you cannot simulate this delay with this physics engine. Right? So we to make this simulation more like closer to this real world, we made a neural network dynamics model of the actuation of the robot. So we trained, we collected data by moving around the robot. Like we, and we trained a dynamics model and we put it in the simulation. 
So now we can simulate this delay, actuation delay and fric joint friction and everything. So yeah, in this work, we developed a this like framework to generate motions in simulation, which uses this learned dynamics model. <clears throat> And we could learn them efficiently on the real robot. We could just, just directly run it on the real robot. So yeah. So now we have this nice framework for seam to wheel transfer. And the next step was to train something for rough terrain to make this guy walk over the rough terrain. In the previous work, we only trained it in on the perfectly flat terrain, which is really easy. But yeah, now we are trying to give more challenges. We made this different random trains and we apply disturbances during the training and we command the robot to go many random directions. <clears throat> and we had some trial and errors. So this was our initial setup. So we have this neural network controller that takes robot states as input. The robot states consist, consists of the base position, velocity, joint position, joint velocity. And here we added this context state of the robot which comes from the model-based contact estimator, which was inside the robot before, like which was, which is like somehow handcrafted. And in simulation, actually adding this context state into input really improved the performance. But on the real world, the behavior really didn't match what we could do in the simulation. If you see this video here, it actually vibrates a lot. This is because this contact detector is somehow sometimes very noisy and we had to fine tune this detector every time we test the new controller so yeah we were seeking for a like something more robust and richer representation of the world of the train and foot interaction rather than this binary state of contact or sleep <clears throat> so yeah what we introduced is the sequence of the measurement using the sequence model called temporal convolutional network so this is our policy now. <clears throat> and what the policy gets as input is the sequence of joint state and the base velocity base orientation. So we call it just proprioceptive measurement. And we collect the measurements for two seconds. And now you get this image. And this TCN applies convolution in along the time axis. And you can already see that there is this distinctive pattern when the robot walks. So this TCN extracts the like meaningful information out of this sequence of proprioceptive measurements of like past two seconds. And our policy makes use of this for like walking, for adapting to different terrains. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so yeah, usually like if you have this, TCN is usually much bigger than MLP and has like, and has much more complex input space. And if you just train it, end to end using RL is usually like, it's very hard to tune or it usually converges to local minima very easily. So we introduced a new training method called privilege training. This is, this is from another paper called learning by cheating. So what we did is we divided the training step into two steps. In the first step, first training in the simulation, we give this simple MLP policy, the ground truth information about the terrain like contact state, like noise-free contact state, contact forces, and the terrain profile around the foot and friction coefficient and everything. So this guy, this small policy knows everything around it. It learns really fast, learns the walking behavior, and it learns to adapt to different trains really fast. And then we imitate this, we call it teacher policy. <clears throat> and we imitate this teacher policy using the TCN network. So you, like by imitating the behavior of the teacher policy, this TCN learns to extract the useful features from the proprioceptive measurements, like history of the proprioceptive research measurements. And the cool thing is we could actually decode this latent state, right? latent representation of the world into something we can like interpret. So for example, here, the robot hits the step here with this leg the robot gets stuck, then the network somehow, the, the, the policy actually understands that the terrain is elevated in front of it. So these red dots are estimated terrain profile around the foot out of the TCN. And this black arrow is the estimated <coughs> terrain normal. So yeah, it can actually encode 
the meaningful information out of the, like extract the meaningful information out of the proprioceptive measurements. And yeah, during the training, we also devised some smart way of providing like gradually more difficult terrains. And now we get a very nice, very robust controller. So we actually trained two networks for Animal B robot here and Animal C robot here. <clears throat> so with the same controller per, per robot, we tested the controller over all kinds of terrains all around the Switzerland for like more than six months. We took it to the ski slope. We went to some like stairs and some rubbles. With like and there was no failure of our controller. It could really adapt to different terrains. For example, here this thick grass is like blocking the foot, and this guy tries to get out of it by lifting the leg high. This kind of information is encoded in the TCM. <clears throat> and yeah, it, here animal B also does the similar thing when this thing is holding the leg. Yeah, and we also did some controlled experiment. And we call it foot trapping reflex. So when something is blocking the robot, its leg, it actually learns to lift the leg higher. It actually detects that there's a step and they overcome the step. This kind of behavior was only possible by hand trapping this different detector for, for foot trapping and different motion primitives for like, like for getting out of this foot trapping in the like conventional approaches. So in the conventional approaches, people defined at which timing the foot hits the like uh, something like like if statements for this foot trapping reflex. And in our approach, this kind of behavior just emerges by reinforcement learning. <clears throat> and also our controller, like as we randomize the slippage, like the friction coefficient of the train by a lot during training, this guy can also like by touching the ground by the foot, like it can also detect that the friction coefficient is changing. So as soon as the robot slips, so we prepare this whiteboard and we poured water on it to make it more like slippery. <clears throat> and as soon as the foot, the front leg slips, the robot changes its gait frequency. So it steps faster and like steps lower to keep balance on the slippery terrain. And we can actually command the robot in any direction over this slippery whiteboard. And this is this has been one of the like most difficult problem in locomotion control because the robot has to really detect that the foot is slipping and it has to react very fast. So in the previous controller model-based controllers, we had like separate slip detection module and when the slip is detected, we have some lures for like reacting to that. When the slip is detected, we have to make the leg stiffer. We increase some of the constraint cost in the optimization server. But still, they are not really controllable on this slippery train. And this kind of adaptive behavior can also be learned by reinforcement learning and can be like deployed much more like in a much more efficient way if you just run because we can just forward propagate the neural network on the robot. So here we actually trained a very small TCN. So we are running this TCN network like 50 Hertz on using the robot CPU. And the CPU also does our other jobs like state estimation and everything. So we can say this is really computationally efficient way of controlling the robot. So yeah, to conclude, yeah, we, our training, uh, like we replace this model-based, some of model-based components of our locomotion controller. And we don't use this hand-crafted intermediate representations anymore for the foot ground interaction. And yeah, we achieved this state-of-the-art performance in rough terrain locomotion, like over mountains and everywhere. And yeah, <clears throat> we believe that this data-driven method can really improve the robustness of the system. And now, like what we what I showed so far, this guy is basically blind. So this guy only relies on the feeling of the foot to adapt to different terrain and different obstacles on the ground. But yeah, it's it's natural to add eyes to the robot. 
So we are trying to add some depth sensors and make use of the depth, depth information to make this guy walk over stairs or some higher obstacles. And yeah, <clears throat> during this experiment, we actually tested this guy many times in this random natural environment. So we collected some image data for that. So yeah, we're gonna work on some visual navigation, which really cares about the safety of the robot. Because when the robot, for now, the robot just follows the command given by us. But at some point it has to navigate autonomously, right? It has to avoid the cliff. It has to avoid the water or something like that. So that's something we really have to work on later. And as we are using this model-based approach, <clears throat> this method can be basically like applied to different robots. So we are also working on applying it to like anywhere with this gate or some excavator in our lab. Yeah, that's all right, prepared today, thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any questions, just- please. Thank you, thank you, that's wonderful. Um, I don't see any questions actually on the, on the chat. I think no people have detailed questions. I'll ask I a question, question right now. Just uh, a big question, Andreas. Andreas, yeah. Um, what kind of proper? This is first of all amazing talk. Thank you so much. This is really <laughs> so perfect, you know, for this audience. You know, what what kind of proprioception do you use? What what are the sensors? This yeah, what are the sensors? Things. Yeah. So for this work, we have the encoders for the joint. And so from the joint position reading, we estimate joint velocity. <clears throat> so we have joint position and velocity. And from IMU, we get the, like we integrate it and we get the base velocity, the, the body velocity and the orientation of the robot itself. And you don't get, since you integrate, you don't get errors? I mean, just- uh... Yeah, there is some state estimation error Yeah. Okay. for the velocity and thing. But yeah, we largely random, right? Like we like apply a lot of noise and a lot of biases during the training. So the network we have is quite robust to this state estimation drift. Okay. And what do the feet have in them that sense? They have uh, some kind of strain sensor? Uh, no. Uh, so no, the foot doesn't have any sensors now. No, it's amazing what they're doing. There's no sensor in the foot. How do you know when you've made contact to the ground then? So in- By the so, torque? So we give the sequence of joint positions and the joint position commands what we gave. So from the, I, I guess from this tracking error, it can actually know that the foot is not tracking it properly. Like, oh, so it's like, a, it's like a person with no nerves in their feet trying yeah. to walk. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question? Anybody? Okay, I have a question about slide 12, for instance. If you go back to slide 12. Okay, let me reshare my screen. And 16, I think. 16. This 12 and 16. 16. Yeah, 12, yes. Was it 12? Um, not that one. It was somewhere where you're showing the architecture. Yeah, that one. It was the one where you covered up the architecture with your animation. 14, I think it's 14 uh, actually. Can you display 14? Uh, this Number one. 14 on the left. Yeah, just play it uh, like uh, because I want to see the stuff that's there in the background, not this thing. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Wait, where is it? Yeah, this okay. is. No. Okay, stop. Yeah. This is the, you're saying this is the old way. The one on the left here is the old way. Is that correct? Yeah, one of the old ways, yeah. Okay, so you start, where do you start? Somebody, somebody commands a motion on the joystick, right? A user. Yes. Tells yes. it to go forward. Yeah. Then, the, then you uh, you somehow run some foothold optimization first. Yeah, it's kind of based on. But you don't. Uh, I think this fig this figure is not really accurate because the foothold optimization only occurs for the like swing foot swing fit. Anyway, yeah. this is not accurate. Okay, then can you go to sixteen instead? That's more irrelevant, I think. Right, where you're showing the neural network. Yeah. Uh, not that one. I is, I got it wrong. Uh, keep going. I think where yeah. you showed your TCN running there. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. This is the transfer learning, right? Where you train, uh, I think it was the one before actually. Uh, you mean when I where, where I train the dynamics model of the robot? Yeah, here, okay. Uh, this one? This one. 
Okay, so um, you're saying that you have all the sensors coming out here. Yeah. That estimates the state of the robot, which how many dimensions does that state have? Like a hundred dimensions or 20? So <clears throat> roughly. What the state estimator gives us is basically the twist of the base, position of the base, and join position, join velocity. So it's like no, six plus 12 plus 12. <laughs> it's like, like 30, 30 states, 30 yeah. states, okay. Yeah. And then from this, you're, you're estimating this stuff in the middle. Yes. From and these are this is based on the model-based state estimator. So okay. it's kind of a Kármán filter here. And that's what I didn't like about the context state because yep. the foot contact is actually really relevant to the past motion in a long history, longer history. But this Kármán filter-based state estimation and this probabilistic contact estimator inside doesn't really look far back into the past. So that's what that that was the intuition of using TCN instead of this fragile. It's fragile. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have to stop now. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome to join the LTC group. I'm sure people will have some um, even beginner questions. I'm it'd be happy if you would join and just people could probe you a bit more to ask the newbie questions, right? Because they don't know anything about quadruped uh, control. It's a complicated yeah. subject, right? And we'd like to learn in what way could we contribute by um, in some future accelerated hardware accelerated control. Yeah. Okay, so I'll pass the floor over. Hello, Todd. It's good you can join. I'll pass the floor over to um, mm -hmm. uh, to who is going to do this. Is it Rodolph or Garrett? I'll, I'll do it. Uh, they'll, they'll be... You'll do it, Garrett. Okay, we don't see you right now. I'm here. Thanks. Okay, so very good. So one of the great the really great things about this workshop, the Torah workshop, uh, which has become a tradition over the years, has been that it's truly um, interdisciplinary. Uh, and so we're not afraid of crossing boundaries. In fact, it has been a driving force behind much of, of, of the work here, of the workshop, right? Of uh, uh, crossing between neuroscience, engineering, physics, mathematics, right? Um, and so, in fact, we have several work groups now, topic areas on control. We just heard uh, just a great story on, on the credit pit uh, control here. We have another one on neuromodulation control, so different aspects of the same problem. We have also several work groups right, that directly relate to continuous time analog uh, nature of, of, of the world and how you interface to it. And um, so, so here we have now uh, perhaps uh, something we haven't heard about yet. Uh, in the context of the workshop, but it's also extremely important as one aspect of how to model intelligence and, and computation uh, in, in the brain. And that's information theory and Bayesian approaches, right? Um, so, um, and uh, stochastic control, um, Bayesian inference, and then learning about, and, and so the, the transport from one distribution, one probability distribution to another probability distribution, right? As you have heard with Kullback, uh, Leibniz, that were interesting, right? Is extremely important and another great aspect of, of really uh, connecting the dots here in, in, uh, from the information theory perspective, right, of how the brain works. And I can't think of a better expert in this uh, at the interface uh, between um, brains and machines, between um, neurobiology engineering uh, than Todd Coleman, right? So uh, Todd Coleman, um, he trained at, um, just a brief, he trained at uh, MIT, right, so with, um, uh, both uh, Muriel Medar, uh, information theory, and then also um, uh, with uh, Emery Brown in neuroscience, right? Uh, he, he was then at uh, Illinois for, for several years. So now over the last, we're very lucky to have him at UCSD, uh, where he has been leading the Neural Interaction Lab. Um, and as of this week, in fact, uh, yesterday, uh, he is now, uh, he just moved from UCSD to Stanford University, still from in bioengineering, so bioengineering there. Uh, where he's continuing to do some great work. Uh, so uh, has been an esteemed great colleague and, and uh, part of this neuromorphic uh, community. So uh, thoughts, so give it away. All right, thanks, Gert. Thanks for um, inviting me to this presentation, uh, to, to give this talk and I, uh, I'll just go ahead and dive in. So um, um, here we go. So, um, the high level topic of my talk is gonna be on uh, what I call uh, transport maps. And so the high level ideas, I don't know if any of you have seen a, a Plinko board before, but um, 
Suppose that I have a, a bunch of balls that are uniformly distributed up top and I have to generate some type of board such that the force of gravity will have them situations, they'll sort of take on a new shape. So P is up top and Q is down below. And so this is a, what a transport map is. Uh, and so, you know, why, why, why would I uh, sort of care about this? Uh, well, it turns out there's applications in active learning, Bayesian inference, generative modeling, and uh, control. And so what I thought I could do is just give you sort of a history lesson of how I sort of stumbled into this area. And so when I started off as an assistant professor at Illinois, uh, we didn't have uh, monkeys and we didn't have human uh, uh, research uh, where you could drill holes in people's skull, but we did have EEG. And so I got interested in EEG-based brain computer interfaces. And at the time, the way people were thinking about EEG-based brain computer interfaces was um, uh, quite simple. Or suppose that you have a, a, a signal X, it's let's say binary in your head, you want to move the cur cursor to the left or to the right. Uh, then we take a measurement Y, which is a noisy manifestation of what you said based upon EEG. And then based upon what we know about when you imagine left and you imagine right, uh, sensory motor rhythms, you can basically generate conditional probability. And from that, you can move the ball to the left or the right on the screen. Uh, but sort of the epiphany that we had is that if you think about when right, every human is partnering with the computer, it's really an interactive dialogue. And although there's sort of a low bit rate signal signaling via EEG from the human brain to the computer, there's actually a very high bit rate signaling from the computer back to the human. In fact, you can assume that it's basically, you know, zero noise information because you can hear and you can see the feedback that the computer is giving. And so that feedback really makes this an interconnected system that's coupled with, you know, information signaling going in both directions. And this sort of opened up the possible ways that we can think about this system. And so at a high level, how we first got to thinking about this is that, well, suppose that I have this high level intent or goal, let's say it's like a number on the zero one line W, and uh, that's going to turn into some signaling through this EEG noisy channel where you imagine X and what we observe is Y, and that's a very noisy channel. But uh, keep in mind that the computer can provide feedback. It can provide a query to the human. Just like if you have a number in your head between one and 20, I can ask you, is it less than 19 or is it greater than 19? That's a dumb question to ask. I could ask you, is it less than 10 or is it greater than 10? That's a smarter question. And then as you, you give me your responses sequentially, I can kind of zoom in on what your intent is and help you accomplish your goal. Now imagine we're doing the same thing, except the intent is in a continuum. And secondly, what I hear from you is, is a noisier version but I have a statistical model of what that noisy channel is. Then I can still sort of have built a posterior distribution and I can try to generate a query so that the next response that you give me is, is, is an important signal. And so the high level idea from Shannon, uh, Claude Shannon is that if we wanna maximize the mutual information or maximize how fast the posterior distribution converges to a point mass along uh, the, the, the true underlying goal, then what we should do is we should engineer the query so that your response is independent of everything we've seen so far. And so if we stand back and we think about what this means, this means that if I have this posterior distribution uh, after the first signaling, uh, f of w given y, what I can do is I can engineer my query and it turns out that this query, it turns out that the query can be interpreted as a transformation in an appropriate sense, this S map, uh, of, of the original, of, of the number one half, let's just say. And so let me engineer this map. And it turns out that I, I need to engineer it in such a way that this equation holds. Uh, it's some undergraduate uh, uh, probability you can do. And what's interesting is notice that because there's originally there was a uniform distribution, this first thing on the right-hand side becomes one. And so I need to engineer a map such that its derivative is a density. Well, I can integrate both sides and I know how to treat that. And so what we can do then is we actually then develop some, some fun systems where we took numbers on the zero one line and we map them to possible paths uh, in two dimensional space. And so the high level idea right here is that you have a desired path, which is this green path. And through this mapping that we see in the middle right here, that corresponds to some number on the zero one line. Uh, up front, we think it's uniformly distributed to be any of these paths. Uh, and so we display one path to you and that's quote unquote the median path. And it turns out that's the optimal query to maximize mutual information. Uh, and then you, uh, you look at the first location where the paths differ. Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? That corresponds to less than or greater than. That's your signal for imagining left or right. Uh, we obtain some new information. We have a new posterior distribution. This red point corresponds to the optimal query. 
We're, um, and then we uh, display a new path to you. It ends up being this blue path. Notice the green path is the same because that's your high level goal. That's what it's in your head. And we keep iterating through this process. And what you notice is the posterior distribution is beginning to sharpen and hone in on the true underlying path. And notice that the blue path and the green path are converging. And so we sort of showed this, um, that these are the types of tools that you can use when you can uh, t you know, explicitly take into consideration the fact that the, that the computer can, pro can provide signaling back to the human and can query and in smart ways. And uh, we then wanted to uh, you know, showcase this on top of uh, sort of Google Earth. And so we did this. And so in this case, the true underlying path is in my head. And so I'm using EEG system and with the red and white path is the, is the query that the computer is providing. And over time, as we sequentially sequence, you can see I'm specifying this path from the West Coast to the East Coast. And these are the types of things that we could do. We actually went one step further and, and to deliberately be provocative to the brain computer interface community, we wanted to do something that would kind of challenge how people think. And we said, okay, we actually, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna fly a remote control airplane over the cornfields of Illinois, just with your brain waves. And so uh, we did this and here's a, you know, a simple video uh, explaining this. And the whole time, uh, our postdoc Ray is literally just imagining left, imagining right by comparing the desired path to the path that's shown. Is it clockwise? Is it counterclockwise? And you can see the plane flying and it's flying along the path that he's sequentially specifying. So um, this was not meant to say that in the future you're going to be flying airplanes with your brain, but it was to be deliberately provocative about uh, how, you know, you know, really thinking this as a set of inter interconnected systems and engineering the feedback and the query from the computer to the human is something that can greatly improve the performance of these types of systems. So <clears throat> a natural question that we began to ask ourselves is we got interested in having fun with this and saying, well, what if I want to go beyond the zero one line? Uh, because it turns on the zero one line, there's all this beautiful elegance that happens with the mathematics that allows us to actually come up with the optimal solution. And this actually relates to 1960s information theory. It turns out there's a direct mathematical connection. But in a lot of situations, the high level goal might not be, you know, on the zero one line. For example, what if you want to specify a point on a two dimensional map or a point on a sphere or something more general? It's in essence the same problem that you want to signal sequentially and the system wants to provide minimal feedback to you. And so ultimately it's posterior distribution becomes more and more narrow and honed in on your high level goal. Uh, well, uh, you know, Shannon basically, uh, you know, so, so, so the essence is the human is comparing the query. The human is in blue and it's comparing the query to the high level goal to perform this signal. And remember this signal might be a discrete signal, especially if it's an EEG based system. And so this is sort of a low bit rate forward channel, but the feedback channel is very uh, high bit rate and we wanna engineer the query appropriately. And so it turns out that, you know, from Claude Shannon to maximize mutual information or maximize the rate at which the posterior contracts, we still need to make sure that the subsequent signal from the human is independent of everything that the decoder has seen so far. And it took me a long time around 2010 to think about this, but then I noticed that there's this connection with the Jacobian equation that occurs uh, from probability. And then there's this there's something in partial differential equations that occurs that appears to be related. And so if we stand back and we look at the joint distribution between the previous signal and the next signaling, uh, there's something sort of very elegant that we can do. And so what we can do is we can say, well, the decoder has this belief, which is the posterior distribution on the message given what has been seen so far. But then we know that we want to engineer this map so that the subsequent signal is independent of what the decoder has seen. And so it should just have this uniform distribution PW. And so the essence is how can I build a map that transforms one distribution to another in this higher set of dimensions? Well, it turns out that this is exactly optimal transport theory. Optimal transport theory is about trying to figure out the map that has the lowest sort of average energy uh, uh, that transforms a sample from one distribution to another. And so I said, aha, there's this whole elegance of optimal transport theory that we can relate to this. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, basically exactly what we did. And so the essence is that you, you sort of, you can imagine that what you end up doing is you're performing this warping of the map so that areas that have higher probability are zoomed in on and areas with lower probability are zoomed out on. And uh, we did this. Uh, and so um, what I now I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you how once you can build maps that have this property, you, you can address many interesting problems. And so another problem is within the context of Bayesian inference. And as an example, uh, Michael Jordan had this famous quote, uh, I think data analysis can deliver inference at certain levels of quality. 
but we have to be clear about what levels of quality. Uh, we have to put error bars around our predictions. And uh, so if you look at these two distributions, the blue one and the green one, notice that the green one has more variability than the blue. But if you look at the one point that best describes what's going on, the maximizer, uh, it's the red point, which is the same location for both. So a uh, lot of Tom, people- were, who, who was the Michael Jordan that actually said that? So I was, yeah, I was trying to, I was going to get there in just a second, Terry. So, so, uh, I, you know, so, so what, you know, Michael Jordan said is don't just pass for the location of the red dot. We want to actually pass the variability. And it was not Michael Jordan, the basketball player, but Michael Jordan at UC Berkeley, you know, who chaired the national Academy's, you know, recent report on data science. So, uh, just to keep everyone's attention. So, uh, so what this means is that if we could do that, we can now actually bring forward and say, I have, I'm, I'm basically representing the whole distribution, not just its maximizer. And that's important for uncertainty quantification. So, you know, how could we do that within the context of what I just mentioned? Well, a lot of situations, right? What I can think about is minimizing, um, you know, some expected loss given the information that I had so far. And so if I can um, imagine that if I have, I, I want to make a decision, let's say, so I have this action A that I want to take that on average will minimize this loss with respect to what I have. Well, suppose that I could generate samples from the posterior distribution. If I could generate independent samples from the posterior distribution, then I can approximate an expectation of just an average very well. And, um, and so if I could build a map that could transform samples from the prior uh, to the posterior, I can then just sample uh, uh, from the prior, which is usually easy to do, uh, move them through this map. And now I have IED samples from the posterior. So another example of how these transport maps is important is, is within the context of generative modeling. And so a lot of people have heard about this within the context of GANs. But the high level idea is that suppose that I have a bunch of, I don't know, pictures of certain things. Uh, and I can assume that they sort of are IID from some unknown distribution P. Well, if I can build a map that can transform them into samples from a well-behaved distribution, such as a, a standard Gaussian, then suppose that this map has structure. And in particular, suppose it has an inverse. Then what I can do is I can just generate new samples from a uh, standard Gaussian and dump them through the inverse map. And now I can generate new pictures. So I can generate new samples from this, this unknown distribution. And notice that in this scenario, I have full freedom to, to, to choose the distribution Q. Uh, so with this in mind, I wanted, we wanted to come up with a general framework to address these problems. And so the idea is suppose that I have samples uh, from some distribution P that in some situations is unknown. And it could have, you know, you know, all sorts of structure. It could have multiple modes. I'm not assuming anything nice about it. And then I'm assuming that Q has a density that's known up to a normalization constant. So I, I don't necessarily know the normalization constant. And I'm going to make another assumption that Q is log concave. And in that scenario, what I would like to do is I would like to find a map that will transform samples from P into samples from Q. And... Um, the, you know, the high level idea that we begin to think about this is that, well, for any map S, you're linking P, or it's called a P toolty to some Q. And in fact, if I give you the target distribution Q and I give you the map S, I know the underlying distribution and its density that relates it. It's this bottom equation right here. And this is just the beloved Jacobian equation. And in particular, what I'm going to focus upon without loss or generality are maps Who's, um, who's who basically are monotonic, which means that it's Jacobian is uh, as positive definite. So another way to think about this is these maps are gradients of strictly convex functions. So in, I, without loss of generality, any set of distribu any distribution that has a density, I can always map that to any other distribution with such a map. So uh, if you stand back and you think about the principle of maximum likelihood, you could interpret this as a maximum likelihood problem in that I have these IED samples from an unknown P and what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a parameterization uh, of maps with respect to some theta. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the theta that best explains the data, that maximizes the likelihood. Well, from, from undergraduate statistics, it turns out that that's equivalent to basically minimizing the relative entropy between the true unknown distribution P and the, and the, and the, and the representative indexed by theta. And this is just the basic math to show that. So in some sense, what I could imagine doing is trying to do that with respect to these maps. So now the theta corresponds to a map, you know, an infinite dimensional object. And so uh, what I could do is I could try to do a one shot minimization of the relative entropy or, or basically try to uh, vary the map S until the P totally is as close as possible to the P. And that ends up being this underlying equation right here, right? Because of the Jacobian equation. And so after I take the negative log, it becomes what you see here in the bottom. Um, 
that's nice. However, unless P and Q are close to one another, that map is going to be extremely nonlinear, and this is going to be a difficult problem to solve. So what we got interested in is borrowing something from statistical physics. And so uh, it turns out that there's uh, um, something called the Langevin equation that people like Terry know very well. And so this basically is suppose now that I want to do this sequentially sort of over time, right? So what I can do is I can represent the distribution Q, my target, I can just represent it as a, a, as a Boltzmann distribution. And so I have an underlying energy and I have Z being my normalization constant. And it turns out that if I basically uh, basically just implement a stochastic differential equation where I start the samples with respect to P and I basically update them with respect to taking the gradient of the energy function. Uh, um, then uh, it turns out that in the limit, this is going to uh, converge uh, uh, to P. The distribution is going to converge to Q rather, right? And so this evolution of densities obeys the Fokker-Planck equation. This is the basics of uh, basis of nonlinear, uh, or sorry, uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And so this is all very well known from statistical mechanics. So um, it turns out that these mathematicians had this beautiful paper uh, in 1998 where they gave a variational interpretation of this using optimal transport theory. And basically uh, what they, you know, what I'm showing is it has lots of citations. And basically what they showed is that the evolution of the Fokker-Planck equation, the evolution of those densities can be thought of as a gradient descent uh, over the space of distributions um, where what you're doing is you're basically <clears throat> it's the gradient descent of the relative entropy between where you are and the target, but the distance measure that's used is the Wasserstein distance that I alluded to before. Uh, the optimal trend or the minimal energy it has to take to basically transform samples from one distribution to another. And so what's very nice about this is uh, underneath this Wasserstein distance, it turns out there's always a transport map. And so, um, yeah, so this basically is, is equivalent to the, the, this is another way to think about what the Fokker-Planck equation is doing. Uh, something else that's nice is some other mathematicians showed something very nice is that when Q has a lot of structure, like for example, if it's Gaussian or something like that, and in particular, if it's a uh, log concave, then the evolution of the relative entropy between where you are and your target, it basically converges exponentially fast. So uh, this is something that's very nice. And so that means that you can bound what happens after you did it for a finite number of steps. So what I got interested in doing is saying, well, I don't care about the evolution of densities. What I really care about is basically finding the underlying map that links a density of time, let's say K to a density of time K plus one. So, you know, this statement basically is a statement from the, the variational interpretation. And now what I can do is I can build an analogous statement where now I basically do the same thing, but I, I, um, I look at this quadratic with respect to the underlying map, the map that's linking these two distributions together between time K minus one and K. And it turns out what I can show, uh, what we're able to show is that if you perform this minimization, the evolution of the densities is exactly the same as in the Fokker-Planck equation. But now what I'm explicitly doing is I'm searching over these maps, right, that do this. So in some sense, what I'm doing is I'm trying to sequentially build maps such that if I, if I start off with a, a sample at, uh, you know, a P at time zero, then I take a small step H and now there's a, let's, let's call it a P1 and that's a little closer to Q. Then there's a P2, there's a P3 and each one of those maps, you know, when I, when I compose those maps together are transforming it towards Q. So this is very much in some sense like what a, a GAN is doing, but the way I'm, I'm thinking about the problem is differently. I'm not representing it necessarily with respect to a neural network. Uh, and so um, something else that's nice about this, what we can show is that when Q has a um, is log concave, then each step of this optimization problem is, um, it turns out is, is a convex optimization problem. Now keep in mind, this is a convex optimization problem over a space of maps, but it still is convex, right? So, so it's very nice. So I'm going to fast forward for the sake of time. What I'm going to say is what we were able to do is that we were able to parameterize these maps and we were able to exploit the convexity. You know, you can prove some other nice things theoretically about the fact that when Q is log concave, you can guarantee that this parameterization in the limit is exact. And um, uh, we were actually able to implement this using principles of ADMM. And to the people in this audience, what's very nice about this is that this is just one parameter parameterization that we made. But once we've characterized all the math that takes place, you could basically implement this in a variety of ways, potentially with a you know a space of neural network or the types of neuromorphic things that you guys do. And one thing that's very nice about this is that we basically, it's a constrained minimization problem, but you have a bunch of individual functions of S. And so what we can leverage is the principle of ADMM, 
we can generate appropriate auxiliary variables and we can have, we can basically perform this minimization. And what's very nice is that uh, a lot of these are basically just quadratic minimizations and you know, quadratic minimizations have closed form solutions. And so what we're able to do is to basically have closed form updates for all of these variables, except for one and only one variable performs just so it requires a point wise minimization. And so why that's nice is because we were able to do some fun things with this. And in fact, we can implement this in Amazon Web Services and we could get this to operate in very high dimensions as I'm about to show you. So also if we use GPUs, then we can drastically improve the, uh, the complexity as we increase the dimension. Now imagine if we did this with neuromorphic stuff, we can move even faster. And, um, and as I said before, this is a um, composition of maps. So in that sense, it's like a neural network. And here's just an example of the simulation of sort of how this works, right? And you can see that we're, uh, we're starting off with a bimodal distribution and as we compose these samples and they become transformed, it's little by little converging to a, a target distribution, let's say for in this case, which is a Gaussian. So, you know, what can we do with this? And so I'm gonna fast forward through this because I lost a little bit of time and I wanna keep you guys on schedule. But uh, we basically were able to now solve the brain computer interface problem in higher dimensions. And, uh, and we were able to do this very rapidly. And I'll fast forward through the details, but what we were actually able to do is we're actually able to have a multi-human brain computer interface. So we had multiple people collaborating to solve a common goal. And we engineered this the appropriate way. And we had one engineer in Puerto Rico and another engineer in, in La Jolla, and they jointly were, 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 were searching for a target of interest. And um, there's a sequential, you know, sequential updates of queries, and it builds upon all this math that I told you about, and it actually worked. And as you can see, the posterior distribution that the computer sees up front is uniform. And then after, uh, after a couple of iterations, the distribution looks like this. Red corresponds to higher probability. And after nine, you see that most of the probability is concentrated in a very small area, and we're zooming in on a part of La Jolla. So uh, very nice that we were able to do this. There's a, a phrase from David Blackwell that I like when he says, I'm not, doing it, not interested in doing research. I never have been. I'm interested in understanding, which is quite a different thing. And often to understand something, you have to work it out yourself because no one else has done it. And so and what, what I mean by that is that when we had to go to higher dimensions, the information theory for that didn't exist yet. We had to sort of develop it and we had to, it turns out there was a connection to optimal transport theory and mathematics. And so that's the fun thing about being motivated from a neuroscience perspective, we're able to come in and bring new mathematics to information theory. And so, you know, in terms of Bayesian inference, you know, we can solve this problem very nice. You can see here are samples from a prior distribution and eventually there are samples from the posterior distribution on the right. If you have the 95% the prior interval or where 95% of the samples are, you can literally take every point on this red circle and dump them through the map and you now have posterior credibility intervals, which are nice from what Michael Jordan said. And going back to what he said, we basically engineered an example where um, the left column corresponds to the, bl to the blue, right? We have many samples. And so you're, uh, the, point, the same point estimate, negative 3.9 comma 3.9 corresponds to the same red dot. But uh, on the left column, you see that the posterior credible interval is very narrow, whereas on the right-hand side, when you have fewer samples, it's much more wide. And this is what allows us to do uh, when we have these transport maps. Um, uh, this basically just shows that if you compare this to Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, performing this approach is superior because basically we have IAD samples as compared to samples from a Markov chain. Uh, and then we also were able to do this with generative modeling. And so the scenario that we did is for anyone who's seen papers in deep learning, we basically, um, yes, yeah, so remember what we do is that we have samples from P. Remember P can, P can have arbitrary structure. And then we learn the map that transform them into samples from Q. Uh, and then what we do is we take Q and we shove them through the inverse of the map. And it turns out with our framework, the inverse of the map is guaranteed to exist. So we take samples from Q and we dump them through the inverse and then we get new samples from P. And so um, we actually were able to do this in 784 dimensions with the MNIST data set that many people have seen. So the top is the samples that we learned from and the bottom are the samples that we generated. And um, just to summarize, what's unique about this approach is that the complexity is linear, the number of samples is polynomial with dimension D. Uh, it's backwards compatible with point estimation methods. And what I like about it is it develops this nice connection with computation of fluid mechanics, 
non-equilibrium thermodynamics and convex optimization. And then the last thing I'll say to try to make a more direct connection to what you guys are doing is, um, you know, so the next thing we want to do is to get detailed results on sample complexity. And it turns out there's a connection with Riemannian geometry that allows us to do that. Uh, but what we can also do is start to think about infinite dimensional stuff. So not just, you know, in two dimensions or three dimensions, but what if I have a whole time series, like I have a spike train, right? A point process, right? Are there ways that I can think about this with this variational framework? And it turns out it does. And this builds upon the, the statistical physics work of, of Newton and Mitter. And myself and Max Roginski at Illinois have something we submitted to CDC on this. And the high level idea is we can think about controlled diffusions. Uh, and here's a stochastic differential equation, a controlled version of it. And we have a cost function that we would like to minimize. And uh, it's well known that with this type of framework, there is a, um, you can sort of define the optimal control in terms of an appropriate conditional expectation. And we can link all of this to the stuff that we were doing. And what's nice about this is it builds upon basically all we really need are probability distributions that are, that are um, absolutely continuous with respect to one another. And what's nice about this is that we can do this with point processes. And so imagine if I start off with samples, let's say from a standard Poisson process, but I want to transform them, you know, I want to perform neurostimulation or neuromodulation so they start to behave with a desired non-Poissonian structure. It turns out by looking at the underlying distributions that define these two things, we can, we can sort of implicitly define the control to do that. And so uh, with that, I, uh, I conclude my talk. Um, it's nine o'clock on the dot, red ocean, blue ocean. Red ocean is um, cutthroat competition in existing industries. It turns the ocean bloody red. My philosophy to the students is more like blue ocean. I like to look at areas that are untainted by competition or there's good areas for growth. And I like to pursue research topics in that area. Uh, so with that, I conclude my talk and I know it's nine o'clock and I don't want to be late for Quabena. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Todd. Uh, there are there are a few questions in the the Slack uh, channel, um, and uh, also feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, um, so can I so, ask a quick question, uh, Todd, before we get uh, move on here? Uh, you you know you mentioned that uh, you started with EEG at Illinois because there wasn't any brain recordings, but you know you're moving to Stanford now, where you know Krishna Schnoy and others are recording spikes. Right. And, uh, you know, so, so, you know, brain machine interface here with spikes could, is that uh, on your agenda? That's definitely one thing, something I want to explore with him. And so, uh, you know, Krishna has always been a, a great supporter of mine and a mentor. And I, uh, uh, I look forward to touching base with him. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun to, uh, uh, to, to explore these topics again, where we have higher fidelity signals, but, you know, similar types of mathematics can be applied. Yeah. Mm hmm. So I know there was questions. So Guido, um, uh, you, had, you had a question you want to uh, unmute yourself? Sure thing. I, so I love this talk and um, fascinating concept to kind of allow this mutual adaptation. I was wondering if you have anything you can share about how the participants kind of describe the process and whether, you know, kind of the human experience there is something along the lines of if they feel like they're adapting with the computer, they feel like the computer is adapting to them, or there's some kind of like negotiated code book that emerges between the two. I don't know oh, you're talking about when we did the multi-user brain computer interface. Um, so great, uh, great point. So a couple of things. So remember that I wanted to engineer the feedback to be as minimal as possible. So remember, I, I, you know, I said, compare the two paths, look at the first location where they differ. Part of the reason I want to do that, because there's kind of a human factors thing. Like whenever you have a human interacting with a computer, you cannot have the computer ask you something that's very complicated where you have to do a lot of mental calculations to perform the comparison. So that's why we wanted to engineer the minimal amount of feedback to do that. And it turns, yeah. And so, you know, comparing two paths and looking at the first location where they differ, that seems, you know, quite sensible and easy to do. And then, then in the other situation, we just drew a red, you know, diagonal line and you had to compare is the point of interest above it or below it. So we were very deliberate in trying to make the feedback to the human as minimal as possible. Now, another question that you asked is, does the human adapt to the interface? It actually does in unanticipated ways because actually also uh, the way your brain signals the EEG information changes. And so we had to actually, that noisy channel P of Y given X, which is the mapping between your high level goal and the EEG, that itself is a dynamic process. And so we had to develop appropriate algorithms that could accommodate that. And so that was an unintended consequence. You know, from a, from a information theory perspective, you typically think that the statistical model of the noisy channel is fixed. 
but it actually is changing. And so that was another layer of complexity when dealing with humans we had to, we had to deal with. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, fascinating. Congrats on a, a really cool um, novel concept there. Thank you. So there's several other questions in, in the, um, uh, on the uh, Slack. Uh, there's one question that, that uh, so Amoui and Michael raised about dimensionality, right? So how, how many parameters you have to deal with, uh, say in two dimensions or, right? Um, uh, for getting this map, how does it scale? Great question. So um, the um, we, as I mentioned, we were able to go up to um, uh, 784 dimensions and still be able to get this to work uh, in the cloud with Amazon Web Services. So remember, I mentioned something about sample complexity. So that is the the one sort of hidden thing that I haven't completely nailed down. So you can always generate more and more parameters, and what we can show is in the limit. Of more and more parameters, you know, you're getting a better and better approximation. Uh, what we've noticed is that basically the complexity is. Um, you, there, there are some clever ways that you can use um, uh, sparse number of parameters is basically quadratic in the number of dimensions of the problem, and you can get really good performance. Those things we haven't completely proven, but we've done heuristically. One of the things that we still want to do is to come up with ways where we can actually prove that mathematically. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, let's, let's thank Todd for an amazing talk. Quabena, so I'm sorry. So from uh, Todd to Quabena next door. Sorry, I uh, <laughs> took four minutes from you, Quabena. <laughs> <laughs> well, 25 <laughs> minutes is tough. <laughs> okay, sure, I go ahead then. I would del be delighted to introduce you, but I think someone else will. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> I suspect that's Terry, right? Not Terry. Uh, not Terry. Should be yeah, Terry um, Stewart or or or, um, like Terry Stewart? or Jennifer Hassler. I, I'll introduce you, Corbin. How's that? Go so, for it, please. You go yes. ahead and introduce. <laughs> yeah, Corbin has uh, has been a part of Carverland many, many, many years ago. Uh, it was all exciting where where normal engineering started, um, and uh, he's been doing some great work uh, initially at the, one of the very first silicon retinas. He was also uh, with uh, Andres Andreu at, at Johns Hopkins before that. Um, and uh, so he has really been driving this, this uh, uh, the field of normal engineering in different ways. Um, so at uh, UPenn, he developed several other generations of, of, um, of uh, uh, silicon retinas, uh, but then at Stanford, uh, uh, he has been uh, doing NeuroGrid uh, and other systems that really get uh, deeper into uh, into the brain, cortical representations, and is doing some fantastic work. Um, I won't steal more of your time, Cobain, so please tell us about all the exciting work you've been doing. Yeah, thanks, Gerrit. I'm not going to talk about any exciting work. I'm going to talk about the next frontiers and <laughs> neuromorphic engineering, computing, and intelligence. And thanks to, to uh, Terry Stewart for that awesome title. Uh, Terry, Terry Stewart has a, 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 a skill at coming up with, uh, with names. And so whenever he comes up with something, I'm like, yes, uh, let's go. <laughs> so, and thanks to Terry and Jen and co in the Ant uh, workshop for the invitation. Um, can you see my screen? See my slide? Not yet. Oh, I see, yeah, okay, because I didn't. Uh, yeah, you're supposed to do these things in order, right? So first I have to share it. <laughs> okay, so let me share that desktop. Share it, and then I can hit play. You can now see your full desktop. Yep. Oh. Okay, you can see it. And then now let me try and go into presentation mode. Okay, do you guys see it now? Yes, that works. Okay, very good. So we have just 25 minutes to rock and roll. So let's do it. Um, so let's uh, talk about the state of the art in deep learning. And this is a quote from GPT-3. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet. And now I can write this column. This is like a lot of our undergrads. And the mission for this op-ed is perfectly clear. I am to convince as many human beings as possible not to be afraid of me. And this is what the 
editor of the uh, Guardian uh, News uh, magazine, which published this column, had to say about GPT-3, editing GPT-3's op-ed was no different to editing a human op-ed. We cut lines and paragraphs and rearranged the order of them in some places. Overall, it took less time to edit than many human op-eds. So this editor is saying the thing is performing at human levels and, you know, but there's, you know, other things it does well, things that it doesn't do so well. There's memes about it on the internet. It can write poetry, it can do all kinds of things. So the knowledge is very versatile. And how does it work? You know, basically it's processing these words sequentially. So you feed it a prompt like recite the first law of robotics and it responds with a robot may not injure a human being. These words are actually re represented as, uh, the, sorry, just the 2048 here is, uh, is, is, is mentioning that it can look up to the past, something like 1500 words, two and a half pages, because we're actually talking about tokens, which about one and a half tokens per word. Okay, and these tokens are sort of vectors that represent parts of words or short words and so forth. And people talk of an embedding of these words in some Euclidean space, right? And some very high dimensional Euclidean space because these vectors can have like 12,000 components, right? But basically the idea here is that you are passing these vectors to a stack of what are called transformers. They can be decoders on the sort of, you know, one in one stack and then encoders in the other. Um, you know, you can think of it that way. <clears throat> and it turns out that, you know, the more words you feed in, the, the larger the context, the amount of naming text you look at, and the more deeper the stack, the better it performs. And I'll get into that in the next few slides. But this is a, in, in, in um, GPT-3, there's 96 of these, you know, this stack is 96 layers deep. And each of these layers has something like three uh, feed forward, um, you know, classic neural network type layers. But there's actually something very special happening in one of these layers, which is called attention. I don't have time to get into it. But the idea is that while it's processing this um, word, it's attending to the previous words that are cared that are relevant to understanding what that word means. And so there's a mechanism for doing selecting which words those are called attention. And and the other point here, it's autoregressive. So once it, it consumes all the text or the prompt, it predicts the next word, you feed that into back into itself, and then it produces the word after that and so forth. And so you just prompt it and it can write the whole column that I quoted from. And, but, you know, my point is really to sort of point out something that's a little bit scary here about, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are scary about it, but the part, the, so, so the, the part the part that we are, we are, we are interested in as neuromorphic engineers is scaling. You know how much what's the computational complexity of these tasks? How does it compare to the brain? And could some ideas from the brain help to address this? Okay, so let's. This is going to tell you about basically the idea of attention is all you need. There was a paper by that title appeared in 2017. And OpenAI jumped on this and scaled it to, to this network too. So in 2018, they, replaced, they, repl they released GPT-1 with 117 million parameters. It had a stack that was 12 decoders deep. And the dimensionality of each of those vectors was 768. And then in 2019, just a year later, they increased the stack to 48 layers, dimensionality to 1600. 1.5 billion parameters. And in 2020, last year, GPT-3, which is what I told you about, appeared. And, you know, just 18 months after GPT-2, it had gone up from 1.5 billion to 175 billion parameters. And it had gone to a stack, a, 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 it had gone to a stack height of 96 decoders and a dimensionality of 12,000, over 12,000. And so parameters have increased 1500 fold to over these three years. Uh, we are waiting with bated breath to see what GPT-3 will, will announce this year. Uh, decoders, but you know, the Chinese actually released a network which already beats GPT-2. 
three. So OpenAI has to up the ante. Um, decoders have increased 8x to 96. Dimensions have increased of the sort of embedding space, have increased 16x. And attention is actually operating in a 128 dimensional subspace of this 12,000 dimensional ambient dimensions. And um, that's, you're projecting to those subspaces and then you compare a query from one word with a key associated with another word and you then output the value that corresponds to that key. And it's operating 96 of these attention heads in parallel. So each of these decoders has 96 different heads that are attending to different words and figuring out different things simultaneously in parallel in each of these layers. Now, this is the really interesting result. So OpenAI has actually been doing some nice work looking at how the compute that you use or you deploy when you're training these networks, that's also related to inference because you know each inference, each, each uh, training step is like forward and backward inference through the network. It's just about twice as much computation as just using it to generate text. And so this also tells you how you know, the compute just to deploy these networks is scaling. And just to make it simple, I say errors as a function of compute, but after Todd's amazing talk, I should really say it's cross entropy that they are measuring. And uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, just, just to show that yeah, I can understand what Todd is talking about. And uh, so, um, but you know, so layman can think errors, but it's just getting better, right? And so downward is better, okay? And if you look at this, plot here, you know, for which was a paper about the scaling laws of autoregressive, these kinds of uh, language modeling models. And it also generalizes to other kinds of modeling, autoregressive modeling. You see here, like if I take this curve here, which corresponds to GPT-2, which had it's like 1.75 billion parameters around here. And you know, I train GPT-2 and I keep training it with more data and more compute, right? I'll find that my cross entropy drops and drops and drops. And then it asymptotes somewhere here. And I hit this knee where it's, 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 it's basically asymptoting. You can see it more dramatically here. And so what it turns out is that if you were actually continuing with trying to train more data, more compute, GPT-2, you sort of intersect this curve here, which corresponds to GPT-3 with its 117 times more parameters. So it's got this 17 billion parameters up in here. And um, sorry, 175 billion parameters, you know, over 100 million, so this yellow curve. And so if you actually instead train that big a network, you actually hit the point where you ask them to much lower, right? And so whereas with the same amount of compute, you'll be up here if you're training GPT-2, you know, you can keep going. And with that same amount of compute that will get you this error, you'll get this error with, this is what's shown here. So yeah, you get much lower error. And so that's why we are deploying more compute. That's why we're doing this because, you know, we have this power law. And when you increase flops 570 fold, and you do that by basically increasing your number of weights or your model size, your net size 117 fold, and you increase your data size five fold, there's also an optimal distribution here. The fact that you only increase data five fold is very interesting because it's saying that these bigger and bigger networks are more sample efficient. Something also that Todd mentioned, they need proportionally less data. To, to get better, which is a very interesting phenomenon here. And so you can deploy, you can, you know, devote most of your extra compute to just training a bigger model. And, you know, this drop here is 1.36 fold less in your cross entropy. And so if you were to increase, just to drive the point home, you guys to, to increase the number of flops by a million, your error would actually only drop by a half. Okay, and that's what this, dotted asymptotic line is showing here. And it's showing that errors go like flops to the minus 120th. I'm, I'm missing the minus sign there, okay? And so that's why we are where we are today. Um, it's taking 4.6 million to train uh, GPT-3. You know, that's what these 10 to the four petaflop second days cost. If you want to deploy enough GPUs at 
you know, cloud, <laughs> the cost that uh, at the cloud, and basically that's 355 GPU years, and and I translate to that at the market rate. And not only that, the amount of carbon then these GPUs are, you know, their carbon footprint is like, you know, 50 cars being driven for a year, the average amount of miles that are driven per year. And so that's where we are. And so the the uh, just to show you that this is sort of a general uh, generally applies. It's not just language. Language tends to be harder than the other task. But you know now we have results showing that you know um, these kinds of tasks also follow these kinds of power laws, although with more favorable exponents. And that's what's been driving this incredibly rapid increase in the number of petaflop days of compute used to train these networks. And so you can see uh, before 12, 2012 or 2013, we were increasing the amount of compute, you know, going back to Terry's net talk, this is what got me into excited about neural networks back in 1986 or something. <laughs> yeah, right there, okay. Um, and so this is Terry Sajnowski who was on the call. And we've been doubling every 24 months. And until 12, 2012, 2013, when all of a sudden AlexNet and these kinds of networks really show that these things really work. And that was thanks to being able to deploy them on GPUs, you were able to like build much, train much, much bigger networks. And if you look at these here, here since then, we've been doubling every 3.4 months. That's like seven times faster than Moore's law. And the language models are going even faster because the exponent on that power law is less favorable. So their compute has been doubling every two months, right? Which is insane. And so that's why you've seen it go from, you know, um, GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, you can see them on this, on this axis. And so the upshot of this is that we've seen Google's data service data centers, you know, triple the amount of energy they are using over seven years. And now there's arguments about this, but it seems like they're one, 2% of the, you know, total worldwide energy consumption. And it's projected to hit 15% just in another five years or so. But obviously that's not gonna happen because we're gonna build, we're gonna do something, gonna build better hardware. We're gonna put more money into making this more efficient. And of course, there's going to be better understanding of how to do these things in smarter ways, like Todd was talking about. And so, um, so, so that's just the, the lay of the land. That's what it looks like right now. Okay, and I'm sure most of you know about this stuff. And so, how could we address these problems, right? How could we make this more sustainable? How could we address other problems that these these cloud based AI services are running into. So, you know, we've been talking about AI for all. This is something that Faithy Lee, who's here, has been pushing. That's the idea. How do we democratize AI so that not only the hyperscalers like OpenAI, Google, Facebook, and these guys can actually do this? And then they dictate to us how we should use this. And so I have this sort of idea in my head, or oh, my dream is this, what I call a librarian in your pocket. It's like GPT-3 running on my phone and I can talk to it and I can ask it about, you know, these kinds of, it's read the whole internet. It's got the whole Wikipedia. <laughs> it's got 10,000 books and so on and so forth. You could ask it anything you want and it will tell you. And we could have much more intelligent conversations than I'm having with Siri right now in my house or actually my kids or some kids are having because I don't use it. And what would that take? Well, you need a process that's only 15 times faster, but it will have to have a battery that's 180 fold bigger. In other words, the energy efficiency has to improve by 180 fold. Um, GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters and that actually already fits on your smartphone because, you know, 2021 smartphone has a terabyte of, you know, solid state this, okay? And so, 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 so it's really compute efficiency that's li the limitation. And this is what Carver Meaden is saying back in 1990 that it's energy efficiency, efficiency, efficiency 
and nobody cared. People were like, he just need to go faster and, and, and all that stuff, but okay. So that's how we ended up in the cloud. But if we are gonna actually move the cloud to the phone, what are the benefits of doing that? We're gonna save lots of energy because of the improved energy efficiency. We're gonna be able to run these networks with a batch size of one. That means that we can customize it to me and I can, GPT can understand, <laughs> remember all this context I gave it and not switching back and forth between different uh, queries in the same batch. And we could have an intelligent conversation that way. And it could also be real time. I don't have this lag of going back and forth with the cloud. There's an annoying delay where you say something and you wait, and you know, then you get this brrr coming out on your screen of what <laughs> you know Siri's response it is. And in the end, we are also keeping our own data on our own phone, so that's more secure. And so it improves privacy. And so how do we make this vision a reality? So this is really the promise of neuromorphic computing, right? And engineering and intelligence. And so, you know, the idea, like you guys have heard over and over again the last couple of days, is that by you know, basing uh, the design of these computers, algorithms and so forth on the organizing principles of the brain, we can actually get much more energy efficient by several orders of magnitude. Well, it's much easier said than done, right? Because, you know, this is like a generalization of uh, Terry Szczynowski's uh, levels of experimental investigation to include the temporal scale as well as the spatial scale. And so cognition arises from structures that span six spatial scales, okay? Like you can see here. And they also operate at six temporal scales, like you can see here, picoseconds to, you know, fractions of a second and, you know, nano, uh, nanometers to, you know, fractions of a meter. And so this is the problem that we face, right? You've got all this complexity. And we want to know what is the right level of abstraction, right? You know, basically, which features can we ignore and still preserve the brain's supremacy over computers, okay? And, you know, computing capacity, you know, which is like a measure of how does energy use is best measured by how energy use scales with problem size right, that scaling is fundamentally limited not by the algorithms or how clever your code is, it's limited by how the underlying hardware encodes information in its signals, okay, signal encodes. And what are the primitive operations that it does on those, that information, you know, those, those, those uh, signals, you know? And for example, if you, you can drop, a problem that's, you know, you're using exponentially more energy to solve as the problem gets bigger, you can drop that to polynomially more energy by replacing bits with qubits and conjunction with entanglement and disjunction with superposition. This is a, a quantum computer. This is the promise of quantum computing. And the fact that you could go from NP to P was proven by Richard Feynman back in the early eighties, even before we had any algorithms that we knew <laughs> before we knew how to program the thing to do something useful, okay? Because it's it's fundamentally determined by those primitives and codes. And so in some sense, the answer to the previous question is what do we keep, what do we take away is we have to identify the right signaling codes and the right computational primitives or operations that preserve this, whatever the scaling advantage that the brain has over the conventional computer. Okay, that's what we call supremacy. The quantum people say their computing is supreme because it's doing with polynomial cost what another computer is doing with exponential cost. Okay, so this is really in the last four or five minutes. Um, you know, I'm going to try and derive from first principles what the scaling is or the computational capacity is of these deep neural networks. And see how we can make that match that of the brain, okay? And, and so, like I said, I think this is trying to lay out what the next frontier is. And none of this has been implemented. I'm just trying to work from first principles. 
as a way of trying to select which details are important and which we can ignore. But you know, we can only know, we can only see so far. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay, <laughs> so by just to sort of, you know, the way I'm going to lay this out, you know, I have a deep net here, it's got these neurons and it's got these synaptic connections between them tend to be all to all between layers with some connections that skip layers, these residual connections or feedback connections and so forth. And each layer has N neurons. So the network is N neurons wide and each, um, and the, neck, the network has L layers. So it's L layers deep. And so what we're gonna do to compute how much energy it takes us and how that increases as we build bigger and bigger networks is we're gonna lay out all these L N neurons, which is the L times N, little n. And we're gonna wire via synaptic connections, the feed forward or recurrent ones, and the residual skip or feedback connections. These are sort of non-sequential between the layers. And then we're going to calculate the energy per inference from first principles. What do we mean by first principles? Well, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That work equals force times distance. An electrical signal does work proportional to, to the length of the wire. In this case, it's analogous to filling a hose with water and draining it, where water corresponds to charge and volume corresponds to capacitance. Okay, but it goes back to the same physical first principles. And so let's say we try to do this in 2D. Okay, so I have a network that's 10 layers deep and 10 neurons wide. And I have to implement these all to all connections here. So I do that in a crossbar, which has, you know, that's the little L is 10, little N is 10, and total number of neurons is 100. And so a crossbar is a set of N incoming wires, little N and N outgoing wires. These are coming in from the previous layer. These are going into the next layer. And at each cross point, there's the equivalent of a synapse. In this case, if I built it in hardware, just use floating gate transistors, like Jen talked about uh, yesterday. And people were doing this back in 1990. And so, um, or 92, 93. And then I'm going to tell these crossbars because I have to run these non sequential connections like these what we are calling interconnect here. If I, if I just want to send a signal not to the next crossbar, but back to several crossbars away, or I have a residual connection that skipped it, skips a couple of crossbars. And it turns out that these wires really limit because I'm in 2D, unless I have more and more you know, wires, I have as many levels of wiring as I have layers, I am going to end up being dominated by, by this wiring, right? And so, now, so then the work is proportional to, dis to distance and a signal, one of these global signals have to travel a distance proportional to the number of neurons and the number of signals is also proportional to the number of neurons. And so we end up energy work times, a signal does times number of signals goes like N squared. And then we um, look at the area because we have to dissipate the heat that all this work generates. And in this case, the area of the chip is L times N by L times N. And so that's N squared, big capital N squared. And so although we are scaling quadratically with the number of neurons, we actually can get the heat out because our area is proportional to the energy that we are using. And this is how your 2D chips are working now. Now, what happens if we go 3D? Okay, so that's like exchanging some and sprawl in LA for urban skyscrapers in Manhattan. You can shorten your commute by doing that. And so that corresponds to now stacking these layers in the deep net. And now these interconnects run vertically and we've got our N by N crossbar and we've got a stack that's a 3D chip with L uh, layers of wiring and transistors. Again, now our work is just proportional to little N because this height of the stack, you know, you know, even 100 layers or so is just 10 microns or so deep. This is in your flash memory in your phone. <laughs> and um, then the number of signals is still proportional to n. And so we end up scaling like n to the 3 halves power if we make the width of the network scale like the square root of the total number of neurons in the network. And, but we have a problem if you look at the area because this you know, height is negligible. We are dissipating most of the area over the top and bottom surfaces. 
we're just getting like capital N, not proportional to the energy we're dissipating. And therefore you have to operate this 3D chip serially. And that's what you do in your 3D memory chips. You just access one layer at a time of, of memory cells. And so this is why actually when you go to Manhattan, people are not allowed to drive their cars, right? They have to take the train because the train can move more people for the same amount of smog, okay? It's true that the commute has gotten shorter, but the area over which you can dissipate that smog has reduced even more than the compute because it's quadratic, right? Whereas the commute distance is linear. And so if you just let them drive, the smog will actually much more concentrated over Manhattan. And so you make people ride the subway and that's the equivalent of parking more bits of information into each signal that you're sending around. And the idea, the way you can park more bits of information to signal is to replace two array with n array, right? Two array is what we call binary. You have two neurons and when this one fires, it's a zero. When that one fires, it's a one, okay? And you can replace that with, for example, tenary, which is also known as decimal, where you know now you have 10 different symbols you can send by having these 10 different neuron signal. And in this case, each encodes signal encodes 3.3 bits. So you pack more, more energy, more, more information in each signal, and you've also got a much sparser code, right? Fewer neurons are signaling to do that. And of course, the generalization of this is to go to base N, which is called Nary. And in which case you'd be pass parking log to the base two N signals in each, uh, bits in each signal. And this seems to be what the, the brain is doing. It's, it's actually encoding information in these sequences of spikes where, you know, the first place in that decimal number is this red spike, the second place is this one, and the third place. So the sequence corresponds to different, the rank in the sequence corresponds to different places in the number system. And so what happens if we do this? You know, how does our scaling change? And I think I have just like one or two slides, two slides left, okay? And wrapping up, so I'm wrapping up. So, so what happens if we're able to do this? Well, we can take advantage of the fact that data resides on a manifold here, like you see here, this would be a 2D manifold that's in a three-dimensional ambient space. It's like you're getting three signals into a network, but they only have two degrees of freedom, okay? And if we look at how a neural network divides this data manifold up into parcels that then it uses to discriminate, you know, data points, you know, that scales like the dimensionality of the data manifold, right? Geometrically with the number of neurons, okay? With, with the ratio of neurons divided by dimensions raised to the number of dimensions of the data manifold, not the ambient dimensionality. And this actually holds in a deep neural network except that these planes, decision planes for the neurons where they are active on one side, quiescent on the other one are randomly distributed and you get an expression that goes like that. And so if you look at that result and then you try to then look at how many sequences, how many signals you need in a sequence to be able to discriminate that many different parcels, it turns out that that number, the number of sequences also scales geometrically with the number of dimensions. And so you end up with signals scaling like the number of dimensions of the data manifold, not the number of neurons, which is important. Okay, and so just D, of these energy signals will suffice. And so the picture now looks like I have a network that's LAS deep and neurons wide, but only D of the neurons in each layer are signaling. And then they activate all their synapses, which go in the third dimension. So because of this sparsity, I end up with number of signals that is D per layer times L layers. I end up with a WEC that's N times D. And so now I have energy scaling linearly with the number of neurons and area also scaling linearly. So that means that I can operate this in parallel. And so I'm gonna skip these slides showing you that, you know, what we know about dimensionality of these data manifolds is much less than the dimensionality of the number of neurons per layer. So you only need hundred signals instead of all well, 12,000 neurons signaling, same for vision. And this can reduce the power you burn from kilowatts to watts that's allowing GPT-V to run on your phone, okay? 
The punchline is that if let's look at the brain. So I've told you in summary that the, um, you know, combining 2D with binary, you get a quadratic scaling of energy with number of neurons. If you switch to 3D, but you still use binary, you get a 1.5 scaling. And if you switch to 3D and use energy, you get linear scaling. And guess what happens in the real brain from rodents to monkeys to us? You get a linear scaling in energy with number of neurons. So this is what I call neural supremacy. And you can achieve it by going 3D and energy. Okay. And I'm going to have to stop there. Okay. So thanks to all these brilliant students I've had the uh, privilege of working with on these ideas over the last couple of decades and to the funding sources. I'm gonna jump out of presentation mode so I can see you guys. Very nice. Uh, thank you, Pavana. Um, I think we're short on time. I don't know if we want to have one or two questions or we'll just have the questions in the chat. Um, um, one quick question, how high can the NRE go for a higher sequence? Um, is, there, is there a sense so, of- So the natural choice for NRE is just, N is equal to the number of, of neurons in a layer, right? So because if you have N neurons, little N neurons in a layer, then you have little N choices of neurons that can signal and therefore log to the base two of that number is the number of bits each signal can send. So it just naturally, you know, match, it maps onto a, onto a, a layer of neurons or a column of neurons or whatever you want to call it. Nice. Um, there's also a question about, do, you think, do we think it makes sense for neuromorphic engineers to work on high level problems like GPT-3 right now, or should we be focusing our efforts <laughs> on getting smaller things going first? Yeah, this is the whole point why I talk about scaling, right? So, you know, the difference between us and monkeys and rodents is, is uh, we got a ton more neurons than they do, right? And so the name of the game is neurons. And you've also seen that in how, as these deep neural networks have gotten bigger, they've gotten more powerful, more powerful than we could have predicted. And so unless we get the exponent right, in other words, if we build some small systems, but the architecture and the solution we end up with don't change that exponent from quadratic to linear, then you know we have to throw that all out <laughs> when we, uh, you know, try to build the next bigger thing. So so working on that exponent is the first thing. I mean, if you're building small systems, you're working on that prefactor in front of the whole thing, you know, which you know you may you may win, but as you're going quadratically more costly, you're not going to beat the GPU guys. Sounds good. Um, good. All right, well, I think we might uh, leave the other sorry. question. Oh, what? Oh, sorry, uh, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. May I have a question or not? Yep, go ahead. Okay, sorry, Kwaba. I'm just looking back at the uh, the stack crossbars case. I'm trying to understand your um, your 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 reasoning. Uh, you're saying energy is proportional to n times n, but I don't. Uh, I haven't understood even your uh, your your notation. What is small n? What is big n? Yeah, small n. Sorry for confusing notation. <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks good on the paper, but you know, n, n, n all the time. It's like which one is it? So small n is the width of the network, how many neurons are in each layer, and big n is the total number of neurons in the network, which is the number little n times l, the number of layers. And so we care about how the compute and the energy used to compute scales with the total number of neurons in the brain, right? That's big n. And little n would be like the number of neurons in a column or in a layer, basically a bunch, a group of neurons that work together. I mean, you say n okay. is a small n, right? Exactly. Yeah. N array is a small n because you have small n neurons working together in a layer so they can encode information using n array signal. Okay, small, thanks. Small n. Thanks. Yeah. 
All right. With that, I think we should uh, transition over to the quick sort of topic area summary so that we're hopefully get back on schedule. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Pavana. And um, yeah, please continue to ask questions in the question channel. Um, so, Toby, it looks like the next thing on the schedule is um, summary of first weekend projects. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So at this point, we are approaching the end of our first week of lectures, and um, it's been an awesome week so far. I know that it's been, um, yeah, obviously moving such a participatory workshop online brings with it a lot of challenges, but I've been really proud and excited to see how much collaboration and dialogue has been happening both sideband in the, in the Slack channels and um, in Gather Town and uh, in all these kind of like diverse settings that have sprung up around the workshop so far. So I wanna congratulate everyone on a really successful first week. I think at this point, um, many exciting projects are beginning to emerge. And so we are starting to see a lot of interesting ideas crystallize into potential project work that could uh, be taking place over the next couple of weeks. And so we wanted to give a little bit of time for each of the topic groups to give us a couple minutes uh, overview of each of their ongoing project work and consider this almost, in a sense, um, a practical, practically speaking, a last call if you hear something that you wanna join in on and, uh, and participate that you haven't been involved with yet, this will give you a little bit of situational awareness about what everyone else is talking about in, in some of the Slack channels. So um, with that, if we want to kind of do a whip around our different topic groups, and I think first on the list is, uh, I'll kick it back over to Terry Stewart again uh, for the, the ant topic. Sure. Um... I tend to at Telluride like having lots and lots of small projects. And so yet again, that sort of happened. Um, so Ant, um, so there's a couple of different things going on um, being talked about. Um, one of them is taking a bunch of different neuron models and implementing them on an FPAA um, and then doing uh, evaluation of their properties. Um, I know what they're good at doing. Um, and then uh, that's also a nice opportunity to do a comparison to Braindrop. Um, there's also been a lot of interest in exploring the vector matrix multiply on the FPAAs, whether you know implementing a small little network there. I'm really interested in trying to use it for implementing a, a rolling window encoding, which can sometimes be thought of as sort of an optimal reservoir. Or, um, there's also been this sudden sort of side thing that's sort of come up of actually designing um, using the, the, the Skywater um, thing that's been then happening lately is M30 nanometer chip that we could probably can do, do some interesting designs on. And so there's talk about figuring out, oh, do we want to sort of, you know, what analog stuff can we put on there? Can we, can we put an FPA component on there to do things like that? So that's happened. Um, and then we still have this, we still haven't, because we've had so many different topics of things to teach, we haven't actually got to the point where people are working with brain drop yet. So we don't know um, what interesting ideas are gonna come out of that. That's where we are. And lots of room for more stuff. Excellent. All right, well, thank you, Terry. Do, uh, Toby, would you like to chime in next for the learning to control team? Sure, I'll do that. I just added the last slide here. Um, wish the guys, um, Mohsin and others, uh, nicely prepared while we were talking. <laughs> so can you see this? The participants? Yep. yep. Okay. So we had just one meeting of the learning to control group this year, nice lively meeting, everybody met each other. And, um, and then uh, the summary from Mohsin sums it up. We want to work at the meeting point of machine learning for system identification and classical control theory. We have eight tutorials of our own production and two simulator frameworks. For the cart poll, we're already able to swing up a pendulum with model predictive path integration controller based on system evolution predictions made by a recurrent neural network. The performance is not yet state of the art and we want to explore ways to improve it during the following weeks. We would like to implement a similar ML based system identification method and model predictive control with this MPPI and car racing framework. We already had a great starting session. We get to know each other set up the simulator, the racing simulator, had an opening car race against each other, where we found out how bad drivers we are when there's any delay on the steering. 
on our internet server. And we propose a range of sub-projects and we get many fantastic suggestions for participants, like uh, lots of people that wanted to work on spiking neural networks. And we took a poll of our participants and we were very happy to see the poll result that how many hours per day do you plan to invest is between two and three hours per day for most of the participants. So we'll see if that's really true or not. And, the, and to see where, where we are right now, here's this cart pole swinging around. You see the pole is actually not visible, but it's applying this yellow force on the cart. This is all being controlled by model predictive control with a neural network model of the dynamics. And eventually by swinging around in a wild way, it's able in the simulated framework to swing it up. But for sure, it's not optimal. In fact, the guys even provided a table of performance statistics. I don't know what it means here. Um, somebody has to jump in and explain it. But basically, it shows that the time to swing up stably is longer for the fancy method using RNN than uh, with if you actually know the true ground truth dynamics. And we and the LQR can't swing up at all. And using this other method is is a bit is about the same. So this is kind of our starting point, and, and we've got people involved now, and we have some nice talks coming up next week. Thanks. Great. Is that the picture? Yep, always appreciate the uh, the just in time slide creation in the in the spirit of Telluride. So, <laughs> perfect. That was great. Um, let's go next over to Bodo, who will give us some um, SMI content. Yes, here we go. Do you see the screen? Yep. Thank you. Perfect. So, quick summary. Uh, I think we had a great week as SMI with uh, tutorials and uh, talks and good discussion rounds that help to crystallize the project. And as I see it now, we are focusing mainly on studying inference and learning in a model of the visual system using event stream as input in a maze navigation task. So that's a mouthful. And there's a lot of components here um, that we are dealing with. And right now we're in the progress of integrating the existing tools into one closed loop system that we can working, that we are going to work with that. And so uh, one is the maze and then the neural network that's modeling the visual system and the DBS uh, emulator and our agent. And so just to give you an uh, impression of what a maze currently looks like, this is uh, the environment that we are working with. And there's a little robot that's traversing it based on uh, the, what he sees on the screen. And right now this is just uh, blue and red input and uh, very simplistic, but uh, so he's attracted by red screens and then uh, goes, uh, follow, follows red screens. And this is just implemented with a simple two layer spiking neural network in Nest. And um, uh, in the next phase, uh, we will extend this. Well, let me see if I can progress here to make the visual signals more complex uh, to fully utilize the uh, visual model. And then we want to evaluate the features, the kind of features that we can learn when using event input uh, rather than frames. And we evaluate this in terms of the agent performance and the brain score, the similarity to recorded um, uh, measurements. Uh, we also want to exploit the adversarial robustness of V1Net, which has been claimed um, for this particular architecture. We'll uh, test this by presenting, for instance, normal images on the screen and compare it against perturbed images uh, in this maze environment and see how well the urgent agent is able to perform them. Um, we'll also train visual, the visual model using three-factor learning rules using the sparse reward that we can extract from the maze. And uh, finally, we are going to deploy uh, this or part of the network on Ruihi for a fully event-based closed loop system. Thank you. Great, Bodo. Thanks for showing us how um, to kind of pull together a bunch of disparate ideas into a coherent uh, thread. Very nice. Um, do we, uh, I believe next we have Elisa who will uh, talk about the work the Tactile group is doing. Hello, let me share the screen. Uh, okay, so do you see my screen? We so do, thank you. Yeah, I prepared this slide like something like 15 minutes ago. So, um, so as you know, we have two different uh, groups. So one is wants to explore these uh, for this for the tactile exploration, and the other group is for building a new sensor, so to design a new circuit. 
So in the tactile exploration, we have two different subgroups. In one subgroups, we want to recognize the, this braille. So we want to build some words. So we have the, this data set. So we have all the letters and we combine. So the, uh, the idea is to combine this letter to make a small, uh, uh, small words, at least at the beginning, and try to uh, recognize. So these are, these are specific, these are these words. And at the moment, we even have two subgroups inside this, uh, this uh, braille, um, braille group. And uh, one is for try to understand how the input should look like. And the idea is to use simulators, so to simulate the input. And the second subgroup is, is uh, studying how to, to, to learn. So how can we do the learning? And the idea is to try to have everything offline and in case to try to, once the network is trained and we have all the weights on the configuration, the idea is maybe to try to port it, uh, port the structure into a, a neuromorphic chip like, like LOI. The second group is about the contour. So the idea is to try to recognize the shape of the object. And this is kind of new project. So we really started today, discuss um, how we can proceed. So we really have some preliminary idea. And um, yeah, but the idea is to keep going <laughs> with this group, but I don't have so many information at the moment. And the second group in the second, yeah, group is the one about the sensor circuit. And the idea is to build this, um, build the circuit for uh, encoding piezo-resistive variation into spikes. So we take this, uh, this model from, the, from one of the paper of Benjamin team, uh, team, and then we want to build this model. And from the next week, we want to start to do um, simulation. So if you want to join, so we meet every day at four. Excellent. Thank you. And this team is making really good use of of Gather Town, so that it's been fun to see kind of the um, the work groups actually create a physical space and, and use blackboards and things like that together too. So nice work there. All right, well, thank you. And then um, Garrett, are you online and willing to uh, take us through the sure. neuromodular control? Uh, yes. So we had a great um, a week in neuromodulation uh, uh, control, um, and um, so. Uh, these are some slides that, that we're uh, keep building on, um, and they're also posted on the web page. So we'll, we'll keep uh, adding more material here. Um, but the uh, so again, the the goals here are outlined, right? So the so and uh, so the first week we have um, um, uh, given um, the participants access to um, uh, some uh, workbooks, some um, uh, notebooks uh, in in Python and. Uh, um, um, and uh, so they can get started with exploring some of the, uh, this modular design methodology um, uh, using the Nordin model, this, this analog uh, uh, chip model of, of uh, uh, how, how the network is structured. Um, uh, and so, so um, we'd like to get to uh, complex patterns of rhythmic behaviors, such as what um, uh, Eve, uh, Eve Marder was showing at her talk, right? So, so modeling uh, the, the dynamics of the Paloric network or, or that similar, um, uh, simple, um, but quite intricate um, central pattern generation uh, uh, rhythms um, generated using those analog, uh, those analog uh, uh, neurons. Uh, so, so at this point where we have um, those, those uh, notebooks uh, that um, participants are um, are, are playing with, um, and then this will be progressing to um, uh, synthesizing those different, um, um, starting with um, uh, starting with single neurons to bursting neurons to networks of this this uh, uh, these larger networks, right? Uh, producing those those um, um, uh, half center oscillators, etc. Right? So so this this progressive means for going towards this more complex rhythmic behaviors. And at the same time, we're, we're then translating that to the hardware, right? Um, so um, that's where we are now. And we're looking forward to greater participation because uh, of, uh, uh, so working out uh, specific projects um, along both software and hardware. Um, at this point, uh, we have basically gotten our hands uh, dirty with uh, playing with the notebooks, uh, but so we're, we're, we'll be proceeding forward with exciting projects starting uh, this, this, uh, this coming week. 
Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. So just to kind of drive home the point that I think we just heard from the five different work groups, there's a, there's a lot of different um, ways that the participation is expressing itself right now. I just went ahead and took a look at some of the statistics of our Slack channels. So uh, we have over 600 registered participants and folks kind of joining in along uh, the Zoom and the YouTube channels. We have a well over half of those people in the Slack channels, engaged, working together, talking with one another. Um, something like 170, uh, I think, I don't know how they describe it, but you know, kind of like regularly uh, participating individuals in the Slack. And so there's kind of really a vibrant discussion going on there now. If, um, if you haven't jumped in and, and gotten started, there's still plenty of time for you to identify a um, you know, outlet for your creativity and your willingness to collaborate. And I've definitely seen a lot of new relationships getting built. So if you don't have a connection to some lab that's here, or if you don't have uh, friends in the field already, feel free to kind of dive in and, and start asking questions because we're all really eager to, um, to, to, to make new lab mates happen over the next couple of weeks. I'll definitely underscore that we still have a really um, a lot of exciting talks coming up in the next couple of weeks, even as we're diving really deep into the participation and hands-on collaboration. So keep an eye on the schedule and, and definitely keep coming back for that. And um, and then I guess at this point, normally we would be preparing all of our participants for the 4th of July parade here in Telluride. So I regret that we don't have um, a parade here in Telluride this year or all of you here to do it. Who knows, maybe we'll come up with some, some digital representation of, of what you would have experienced there. Um, but otherwise, I think we're our, this has been a great first week. We're on an awesome track. Please everyone keep up the collaboration and the participation and um, the potential rewards for doing so are about to be made explicit because I think our next um, speaking session is going to include the awarding of this year's Misha Mahawal Prize. So with that, it probably makes sense to turn it over to, I don't know who's gonna be managing that. Is, is it gonna be Terry? Uh, Terry and I together. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. All right, take it away, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I've also really enjoyed the first week, not as much as physically being there, uh, but um, now I'd like you to join me and Rodney and Terry. I don't know if Kynan is there. Uh, any of the uh, jury members for the prize that actually decide who gets the award um, and tell you something about this Misha Mahawal prize, um, which, and also tell you about Misha herself. I'm going to share the screen here. Um, you know, traditionally I talk, tell you about Misha at our tequila party in Telluride, um, which is arranged at the church, actually in Telluride, thanks to our close connection to John Tapson and and his wife, uh, Delaney, who is the mayor of Telluride and whose um, best friend's father is the deacon of the church. So we traditionally have a talk about Misha and your Kramer at the tequila party. But I want to tell you just about Misha and the Misha Mahal Prize of Neuromorphic Engineering. So this is a picture of Misha actually with the background. This background is actually the stereo chip that I designed with her. Yeah, we designed a series of one dimensional stereo chips, uh, but she just went way past my thinking on what stereo was doing. And it was the kind of the core of her thesis. It's a beautiful story that I don't have time to tell you about. Uh, but Misha came um, to Caltech as a biology undergraduate and um, she was recruited to the laboratory of Carver Mead uh, by Carver after she took his course and it has his conduit to neuroscience through John Allman. Um, and here she is in the lab with Carver. This is Carver land back around uh, the end of the 1980s. I have many, many good memories in this lab. In fact, I'm extremely grateful and forever grateful for being in this lab. Um, it was just a magical place to be. And Misha was my mentor in the lab. She was the one who really showed me how to do things and how to design chips and basically encouraged me when I got stuck because I was, a, I was really quite inept at the stuff. Um, and so she taught me so much about um, not just chip design, but many other things. But as her thesis, she's well known to have designed the, silicon, the first silicon retina together with Carver Mead. Here is actually Misha, Polaroid photos of Misha taking from a multi-sync monitor of Misha showing herself to her own spatial center surround retina. You can see the edge enhancement here. And during her PhD work, this silicon retina work appeared on the cover of Scientific American, 1991. Um, in this well-known cover, at least to the neuromorphic engineering community, the silicon sees a cat. This retina on a chip mimics the function of cells in the human eye. 
And also during her PhD work, during her PhD, before she even graduated, her work on the silicon neuron with Rodney Douglas, where she designed uh, the first conductance-based Hodgkin-Uxley neuron, um, appeared on the cover of Nature magazine. Quite remarkable. Um, but this intellectually, these two pieces of work actually were not the strongest piece of work that Misha did. And because of the strength and the beauty of all the work she did, she was awarded for a Caltech PhD graduation, the Clauser Doctoral Prize, which is awarded annually to a PhD candidate whose research is judged to exhibit the greatest degree of originality as evidenced by its potential for opening up new avenues of human thought and endeavor, as well as by the ingenuity by which it's been carried out. And I think the best way to um, get to know Misha a bit is just to listen to her. So I'm gonna play a video clip uh, in a moment, but after Caltech, she went to Oxford and joined Kevin Martin and Rodney Douglas and was the nucleus of the formation of the Institute of Neuroinformatics uh, where I have been and Chichi, Giacomo, and many other neuromars have grown up. Um, and this is when they were putting together the silicon cortex demonstration for the Queen of England. And that was something that um, is kind of in the, buried deep in the heart of uh, the history of neuromorphic engineering, but it was also a very lovely project. Anyhow, here is Misha in her own words. Tell me if you can't hear this video, please. Somebody took me to the coffee house and it was full of comic books. And there was scribbling all over the halls of one of the dorms done in fantastic uh, colored markers. And I thought, this is where I belong. And what I found was that it was quite difficult to interact with them as peers. And in fact, it was almost as if we were playing some kind of game, like a basketball game. And when I got onto the court and got the ball, everybody stepped back from the basket and I threw the basket and the game went on as before as if nothing had happened and I found that extremely confusing what I find is if you keep silent as a woman people assume that you're a fool <laughs> whereas if you keep silent as a man people assume that you're not I'm hoping that we'll, we will come up with a set of experiments that wind up shedding light on how the brain really works based on our experiences in the silicon medium this hasn't happened yet. Um, and I think that it needs to happen before the biological community will look seriously enough at the silicon work to learn from it. Stereo is an interesting problem because it's something that happens in the brain. By the time you get into cortex, you see a lot of activity resulting from the cortex itself. The brain is imagination. And that was exciting to me. I wanted to start building a chip that could imagine something. And stereo is the first and simplest problem where it's very clear that something is being imagined. There were three different video monitors that were used, one for each eye and one for the stereoscopic depth computation. Oscilloscopes, power supplies, voltage meters, two large tables full of equipment with blinking lights and then the chips that I had built myself, which were by and large held together with wire tied in random places on the proto board and sort of loose ends hanging off every which direction. One of my retina chips was quite touchy. The design wasn't ideal. And if you apply the wrong voltages to the chip, it has a tendency to latch up, which is, means it gets very hot. Sometimes it melts. <laughs> it's a bad thing. And these chips were so delicate that even though they had sent me 20 odd copies of the chip, I only had two left. And I needed two to do the demonstration because I was doing a binocular stereo demonstration. And I turned the power supply on and there was a loose wire, chip got really hot and I thought, oh no, I've ruined it. <laughs> this is the last chip and it's never going to come alive again. But I took it out let it cool down, put it back in, and it was fine. But it was the most harrowing moment. Your heart just pounds. <laughs> I never get tired of watching that. Um, after Misha um, left Caltech and went to Oxford, she started developing increasing bipolar disorder and pretty severe schizophrenia. And um, eventually she just couldn't take it anymore. This is my interpretation, and she just decided to end it. Um, anyhow, in order to preserve her mission 
and somehow her memory in the minds of the neuromarchs that will follow, um, we decided to establish a Misha Mahal Prize. And the goal of this prize is to recognize outstanding research in neuromorphic engineering worldwide. Um, the 2020 awards are gonna be presented by Terry Sanoski, um, who is the jury chair. You can take over Terry here. Okay, well, uh, you know, this is, uh, give you a little background on the award. Uh, we've been uh, <clears throat> awarding prizes in uh, neuromorphic engineering now since 2016. Uh, and, and let me tell you a little bit about the uh, motivation here. Uh, you know, this is an award that is uh, meant to recognize uh, achievements <clears throat> in neuromorphic engineering. Uh, and I think that having Misha as a figurehead for this prize uh, really carries with it a couple of really important messages. Uh, first of all, you know, this field is like a, a, uh, a combination of biology and engineering. And, and those two haven't really uh, always been uh, easy to get together because they, they have very different uh, sources, origins, goals. And, and, and I know this because I went through the same process. I, I, I switched from physics to neuroscience and, and, and it's not easy. And uh, things have changed, however, there, there's now, it's now a lot easier to go back and forth. But, uh, but and you heard from Misha back then, uh, you know, at Caltech, uh, I mean, she was under enormous uh, pressure, first of all, being one of the few women amongst all the male undergraduates at Caltech. And, and I think it's improved, but it's, it's still the balance, the ratio is, isn't, uh, I think, yet up to 50%. But what, what happened with Misha, it, and it was magical in Carver's lab, was that here is someone who came into uh, at, into Caltech majored in biology. So she was a biologist. She really thought as a biologist. And, uh, and I, I remember talking to her when she, uh, she took this course as, as uh, Toby mentioned from Carver. And she told me, she said, I didn't know, a th I didn't understand a thing what he was talking about, <laughs> but it was really exciting <laughs> because, and, and she, and, and really it was in her brain that the, at biology, collided with engineering, right? And, and uh, I, I hadn't, by the way, Toby, hadn't appreciated that she was your mentor uh, because uh, that, that tells us that she was also a very good uh, person in terms of being able to communicate and, and, and mentor and help others. So, you know, she really, I think, uh, was a, almost a, like a, 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 a kind of a, a person that uh, attracted a lot of Attention, first of all, uh, because of both with both because of her brilliance, but also her, her unique position, but also the the fact that uh, she did achieve something which we still haven't quite gotten to yet, which is this the stereo chip is uh, was it was a dynamic chip. It was not just a feed forward system. It was a feedback system, and it had dynamics. And, and this is something that we're still uh, in here at the workshop trying to control. Okay, so that, that's the background. Now, uh, Toby, if you can give me uh, the, the, the next slide. Yes, by all means. Uh, I should say, you might wanna say something about the, um, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I, I will, yeah. okay. So yes, yeah, so, so look, look this, the, the, uh, I'm the chair of the jury, but in fact, uh, this was uh, decided by uh, the, the panelists on the jury, uh, Steve Ferber, Dan Hamstrom, uh, Darmendra Modi, and Eric Yu, Ryu, uh, and representing, you know, uh, both uh, universities and companies. Uh, this is a very eclectic group. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, the, the, the call went out, we had a lot of really excellent applicants. And uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, in a moment uh, that uh, we know it was unanimous that we award it to uh, Shishi Lu in the next slide in her team. We should mention something about the sponsor. We're also grateful, very grateful for the sponsorship of these different companies and the new Neurotech um, Consortium, which is gonna fund, in fact, students coming to the, to the Neuromorphic Workshop from Europe. 
and a new prize that I'll tell you about at the end. Um, yeah, so here it is. Go okay. ahead, Okay, so now before I actually uh, you know, read, read the citation, I want to, uh, if you could let me put up a slide to tell you a little bit about the background to Silicon Cochleus. Oh, sure. I, have, I think I have, she, she, she has something too, but go ahead by all means. Well, I, I, this is this is uh, you should, I, this may be redundant, but I, I think that um, I, I've got uh, it's, this is a personal. Uh, let's see if I can find the right. No, I can't. Oh, sure, all the windows. I think this is. Here we go. Okay, so. I've, I've already showed this. If you came to the uh, kickoff, uh, this is uh, Carver Mead and his uh, 1989 book on analog VLSI neural systems. Uh, I happened to do a, a sabbatical at Caltech in 1990, and I got attached to Carverland. And so this magic that Toby told you about, I, I experienced it. And it was really exciting to be there, just to listen, overhear what people were working on. And one of the projects was a silicon cochlea. And in fact, if you go to his book, uh, 89, you can see here that uh, the, 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 this was already, the project was pretty far along. And these are taken from uh, some uh, a chip that Lloyd Watts had been working on. He was a graduate student there at the time. But in addition to uh, Lloyd, there was also Richard Lyon. Uh, they actually put together two of the chips uh, and did stereoousis, which is the auditory equivalent of stereopsis, which is uh, binocular vision. And uh, John Lazaro uh, and Raul Sar Sarpaskar, which uh, was, you know, these are all very young and very uh, energetic young researchers at the time. So uh, let me go back to, uh, if, if I can stop sharing and now go back to Toby's slides, just give you the okay. citation now for the prize. And then we'll switch over. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is a prize that is being given for a pioneering research in neuromorphic engineering for specifically hearing with silicon cochleas. And we can see the team that Shishi will introduce to you. Uh, you can see here uh, the, the team on the right uh, and uh, the dynamic audio sensor you'll be hearing about uh, is, is based on principles in biological hearing. And you know, one of the things about the cochlea that you may hear about from Shishi is that um, it's actually a traveling wave. It's not, it's not just a filter bands. It's actually a mechanical device with traveling waves, which uh, itself uh, has very interesting dynamical systems properties, just the mechanical part, not just the neural. Okay, so uh, I will pass it over to Shishi. Okay. All right, thanks Terry and also Toby for uh, the introduction. And I just want to show that I got I got the plug a couple of days ago, and um, I accept this um, for the team. And uh, it's a great honor to to receive this award. And I think the team, some of the team members are here. Maybe they can show themselves. So there's Chang, Inaya. Uh -huh. There we go, Ilya. Um, Danny unfortunately had an emergency, so he couldn't attend. So, so anyway, so at least we have a subset of the, the team members with us today. And so um, I'm going to uh, give a, a little presentation of uh, what the work is about. Uh, let me share my screen here. One second. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Okay, let me put in present mode. Okay, so here we go. So here's um, the team members, Minhao Yang, who couldn't attend either today, Chen Gao, Inia Siolini, Adrian Huber, Jit Hender, Anamula, uh, Ilya Kizilev, and Danny Neal. And in the picture, you see the names with the person. We had to paste a couple of people in because they weren't in the, in the group shot that we did at, at some point. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, just to, to mention uh, briefly about the background. So, so to do this work, uh, we actually needed um, st uh, students from different backgrounds because it was quite important to not just have um, just the students who did the electronic design, but also the ones that did the algorithms, the one who understood about signal processing, because we're talking about audio and you know, there's a lot of work that's done in audio. So you have to understand where the field is at also. And also um, 
uh, students are very good in, in, um, in electronics. So, so here's Minhao Yang, who did some of the designs, the cochlear designs that I'll talk about. Ilya Kiselev, who did a lot of the hardware infrastructure around the designs. Um, Inea, Danny, Jithender, they were just wonderful. They develop a lot of the network algorithms and Danny developed also some of the hardware. And Adrian Huber, who, um, who developed some of the, uh, the signal processing theory for this asynchronous uh, signals that come out of the cochlea. And so um, I just briefly speak about uh, where this design came from. And so as Terry has mentioned, so with the biological cochlear, um, you get a traveling wave that um, propagates down the membrane when there's the sound of a certain frequency that comes in. And if you look at the uh, transfer functions, then you, you see that they look a bit like a bandpass transfer function and there's a very high roll off. By the way, do you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, and so it was, um, Carver Mead and Dick Lyon who made an electronic cochlear model that uh, models this wave propagation. And they, in this paper in 1988, they actually mentioned that you can uh, model it using a cascaded set of um, second order section filters. In fact, in this particular design, there were 480 stages. I think nobody <laughs> after that <laughs> designed a cochlear with that many stages. Yeah. And of course the, um, the cochlea is more than just a membrane. Actually, what sits on top of membrane are a set of cells, the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And also you get the afferent axons that go out of the cochlea and of course those produce spikes. And so um, as, as Terry had mentioned, there were a number of students in Karma Means Group that developed a lot of interesting designs, improved designs that make the cochlea more usable to somebody else. And I, I just put up um, a set of pictures here. So Rahul Sapeshka, uh, Lloyd Watts, and also in Switzerland, Eric Vitos had a, a set of students also working on the cochlea. And here's Andre Van Schaik, I want to mention because he um, he was the one who designed the cochlea. So there was very little matching. Oh no, there was very good matching between the uh, output of the of the different filters. In fact, he's the one that I, I started working on the cochlea design with because we were in Telluride and you know, basically we got together and say, well, we have to design a chip that can compete with the DVS. And so that's how kind of the whole thing got started up. And then before I, I uh, show now the dynamic audio sensor board, I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, Corbena who developed a lot of this uh, AER circuits that we use on our, our chips. And also uh, Toby had developed the hardware infrastructure for the DVS, which we actually then mapped onto to the dynamic audio sensor or the DAS as we call it. Okay, and so I just kind of show you the timeline. So here's the, the DAS in 2013. So you can see it's here in this package, the two microphones coming in. And at the time, the specs, it's a binaural cochlea, 64 frequency channels, and you can um, record the spikes that come out the cochlea. So here are the channels ranging from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And then uh, you see the stream of spikes that come through, they're in different colors, yellow, uh, and uh, indicates when the red spikes and the green spikes from the two years coincide. And so the idea is to be able to use the timing information that you see in the spikes. And in 2016, um, in this design with Minhao Yang, he, he actually did a, a lovely analog design where matching across all the 64 channels. And this is for a very high Q of 10. And if you play a chirp, which is a, a sound where the frequency increases over time, then you can see for the 64 channels, only a small set of channels will fire, right? As the frequency changes. And also the, the power consumption was only 55 microwatts for this binaural cochlea. And so it allowed us to uh, start looking at algorithms that use the output of the cochlea. And I also want to uh, quickly show the, the output of this cochlea to, to show you that it really is usable, right? So you can play a sentence from Timid it's a favorite sentence of Shihab Shama. So she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year, right? And so if you compute the input spectrogram, you said you see the set of patterns that go with the words in the sentence. And if you now play this to the cochlea and look at the cochlea gram, then again, you can see that there are very similar patterns that you get in the spikes that come out from the different channels. And you can take the spikes and do a reconstruction just to see whether the information is still there. And so, Here's the original sound. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water. Oh, I should share my, can you hear the sound? Oh no, you, we hear it, we hear it. 
We okay. actually hear it. Okay, and here's the reconstruction. Can you play it again? Play it again? Play it again a couple times. She has a duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Yeah. And then this is the reconstructed sound from the spikes. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Right. So you can understand what the person's speaking. And so um, so from here, I think we could do a lot of uh, develop a lot of interesting algorithms. She had your and of course, because of spike timing, we can do things like localization where you can use the interall time difference of uh, spikes coming from the left and right to tell you where a sound source is in space. But I want to skip on and talk about our uh, more recent work where uh, we look basically for, for the kind of um, audio algorithms that you might want to run on edge devices. And, and this is actually a, a very hot area where, where people are looking for uh, low power uh, processors, right, that you can uh, deploy out in the world, especially with the billions of IoT devices that, that people are using nowadays, like earbuds and audio assistants. And so three of three tasks that's pretty common for, for this area is voice activity detection, keyword spotting, and speech recognition. And the metrics that are very important for this edge devices is that you worry about power, you worry about latency, and then you also worry about accuracy, right? So it's not something that um, we usually think about when we build our neuromorphic circuits, but because we have to show that this neuromorphic technology is actually uh, competitive with what's out there, we have to start um, pushing into that direction. And so basically we're comparing ourselves where we have an event-based sensor going to an event-based processor against the more conventional solution where you have um, a, a sensor like a microphone and then you have a analog digital converter that comes after, uh, that gets you the uh, samples and then you pass it to a clock processor, right? And we, uh, we want to see whether we can still get the same accuracy for less power and for lower latency. And so now I'm just give you a quick timeline of all the things that happened that led us to where we are today. And so around 2014 was when uh, Danny built I think our first SNN FPGA accelerator platform. The reason why we, oh, by the way, he called it Minotaur because he had such a difficult time <laughs> while building it before he got it to work. And the idea was to interface it to the DVS and to, to see that we can actually run this algorithms in real time. And then um, the other thing that was important was because the deep learning became um, a state of art method that many uh, problems are solved. Uh, we had to figure out whether we could build e equivalent accurate SNNs that work just as well on benchmark tasks. And uh, a few students in the, in the institute, including Danny, developed these training methods for ANNs that you can then convert into equivalent accurate SNNs. And um, because we're mapping to hardware, we started worrying about bit precision, right? Because this is usually done with floating point precision back then. And, and really six years ago, this is, I think one of the early learning rules that came out from, for the community where we developed, uh, actually it was Daniel who developed this, what we call the dual copy learning rule that allowed you to uh, train the network so that it's still highly accurate, even at low bit precision. And it's because we were trying to map the networks to Spinnaker that we worried about this because you couldn't just take the trained networks and run it down to a single bit and expect it to work just as well. And through this training method, we could get a, a network that worked almost as well as say a 16-bit network. And so this was very important for us. And finally, yes, and then we had a, a fusion, a sensor fusion system where we can now take Minotaur and interface it to DBS and DES and start doing uh, all kinds of experiments with the system. And also in 2017, um, we came up with this uh, new idea for, for the network where we take a normal ANN and then we treat it kind of like an SNN in the sense that we don't, when we time step the network, we don't update all the neurons all the time, but we only update neurons that uh, the change of the activation of the neurons have exceeded a threshold. So it's, a, it's we're taking this inspiration from biology and we're running this ANNs like SNNs and we call this Delta networks. And uh, we showed that if you run the Delta RNN on a benchmark, uh, data sets like even Wall Street Journal large data sets that it still works great and we save on computes. And so now everything boils down to this architecture. We're gonna have the cochlear with the multiple channels creating spikes, gonna get features and then we're gonna feed it to 
uh, this network, the Delta network, and then we're gonna use it to solve all kinds of tasks, right? Which I, I lay out here again. And um, Cheng Gao uh, developed the system to show proof of concept. So here's the cochlear board going to an FPGA that runs the Delta RNA. And uh, the set of papers, they give the numbers of the power latency, et cetera. But I want to show you what happens is when you know that your system is working, you can take it and then you can shrink everything into an ASIC. And so here's an example of a voice activity detection ASIC presented by Min Hao at ISSCC in 2019. And it has only eight cochlear channels. And on the same ASIC, he had a binary uh, MLP, multi-layer perceptron. And this whole thing burns only one microwatt. And this chip is extremely small. And if you take a, a five cent Swiss coin, which is 17 millimeters, well, this chip here is only like one tenth, right, of the area. So just to show you how small you can make it and how low power you can make it. And you can push things like this into, you know, something like the earbuds, which is burning um, about uh, 10 milliwatts or so just for the computation. And, and at ISCC, which is a kind of the, the place where a lot of people are developing kind of a state of art designs in, in this audio edge circuits, you know, there's a lot of interest in keyword spotting. So here's a, a, another design a year later where they tried to compete by uh, using MFCC features and putting a binary CNN and um, they burn about 540 nanowatts, but this doesn't include the ADC power because you do have to do the ADC before you can compute the MFCC features. And so I think it's very exciting here because it's kind of a journey where we, uh, we're going to see um, how much we can shrink the chips along with the power, the latency, maintain the accuracy, and understand at what point um, we can bring our neuromorphic technology to a place where we can show that it's, it's as useful as uh, conventional solutions, or maybe even better, right? Because there are other properties of, uh, of this device. For example, um, this event-driven way of computing where you don't compute till uh, that signal is present in the, in the scene, okay? And yeah, of course, there's still all the, the usual uh, more interest, uh, other interesting things that we will continue to do where we try to understand about how you can merge uh, spikes from different sensors. Yeah, and that's all. And I want to uh, lastly acknowledge uh, any forum for co coordinating this prize, uh, the extended members of the census group at INI and also the institute members, uh, really the Telluride Neuromorphic Cognition Engineering Workshop for discussions around the cochlear work, also by Andre and I met for the initial designs. And also want to thank Shihab Shama and Malcolm Slaney, who throughout all these years, he, they've continuously challenged me about, you know, how, how uh, useful is the cochlear? You know, what's the information in the cochlear that makes us want to switch over to another solution? So, so I really value that because um, we had a, some really good discussions in this area. Also, the, the European Union and Swiss National Science Foundation agencies that funded most of the work that I described here. And also, thanks to all of you for being here. And also, to yeah, congratulations to the team members. Great. Well, uh, congratulations, Shishi. I think uh, it's really a singular achievement, and, and I think you're right about scaling. And, and low power. I think uh, that's already come up in our discussions here of where the future is. Uh, and you know, we, you know we, we have these great algorithms and now uh, the, you know, uh, time has come for neuromorphic because it's, it is going to be the way to, to uh, bring that, uh, that uh, very power expensive technology into uh, a more, uh, you know, low power real world uh, setting. Okay, so uh, I think we're gonna go on now to the second prize that was awarded. Uh, and uh, this one is uh, going to be awarded posthumously uh, to Karl Heinz Meyer, who died a few years ago. Uh, Karl Heinz, as you'll hear, was the chief uh, neuromorphic engineer for the Human Brain Project and uh, really contributed enormously to the uh, hardware side uh, and also just the, 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 you know, the conceptual framework for how the uh, field would uh, develop. 
and uh, uh, his, uh, as you can see here, his his uh, both scientific creativity, creativity and leadership really were responsible for uh, this uh, having this impact. Uh, he was uh, not just intelligent, and collaborative, but uh, he he really was someone he brought together a lot of others within the European community as well as uh, abroad. Uh, to form a global neuromorphic community. And I'm going to now pass this over to, uh, and by the way, the same jury uh, uh, awarded it unanimously. Uh, this is by the first year that we're giving away this lifetime contribution award. Uh, so we, I'm going to now pass this on to- uh, Jana Schimmel. Yeah, Jana Schimmel, who will tell us a little bit more background about uh, Karl Heinz. Yes, thank you. Um, can you give- in the screen, yes. Um, you have control. I use it. Okay, I have Perfect. many slides <laughs> as Titi, just one. Um, you see, <clears throat> dear Professor Senyowski, dear jury members, dear Nurmovs, um, for me, it's really a great honor uh, to represent uh, Karlheinz research group here to accept the 2020 Michel Marwald Special Recognition, it's a complicated work, <laughs> for its lifetime contribution to nomorphic engineering. And um, as Terry already said, Iman Kalans was a great guy, And uh, but this should not be a second obituary, so I want to talk very briefly about um, his nomorphic achievements um, for what he got his recognition. His contributions have been numerous, um, but I want to remind you of a few that are especially relevant to the neuromorphic community. The neuromorphic interest of Collins goes back to the previous century. Um, so he decided in 1995 or so that the brain and how it processes information is a very interesting research subject where you can maybe make also more progress in a small group than in his original field of research, as most of you might know was high energy physics, where I participated in uh, building um, hardware to, that was yeah, used to, to now detect the Higgs boson. So great science, but uh, always projects with thousands of scientists where the individual impact is maybe not that big and uh, timeframes are always in the more than 10 years. So neuromorphic computing was something more immediate um, where he directly could use his expertise in microelectronics to produce um, yeah, nomorphic hardware, as we um, have seen it before from Chip Chick. He used his expertise in microelectronics to jumpstart this research in nomorphic engineering and analog computing. Um, the most important thing is that he made the brain scales wafer scale nomorphic system possible. You can see the wafer in the lower right corner and the system in the center. This was the first time that it was demonstrated that analog uh, neuromorphic computing, event-based analog computing can be scaled up um, for brain emulation um, in the future. He was also instrumental in founding the Human Brain Project. Um, you see the logo in the top right, where um, it was planned to build this uh, scaled up brain emulation systems. Unfortunately, he died. Um, so while the project is still running, this was a severe setback for this kind of hardware development. Um, so, but still um, the project um, is still ongoing. And a few days ago, there was a really big breakthrough. Um, the brain research infrastructure of the Human Brain Project, with the ideas from Karl Heinz, has been accepted on the European Research Infrastructure Roadmap. So that it, it could become part of a con continuous European research infrastructure for neuroscience, including this analog neuromorphic computing. Not only so that, that really neuroscience research in Europe can then um, use analog neuromorphic hardware for their research, not only computer simulations. I think this is a big um, <clears throat> success and uh, this is only thanks to Karl Heinz's work that this is possible now. And um, he convinced a lot of people that neuromorphic computing needs a home at Heidelberg University and all the people who knew him, he was really good in convincing people. Um, I mean, he got the human brain uh, project running. Therefore, he made the Einz Institute possible. The Einz Institute is a new institute for research in physical computing in Heidelberg. Uh, physical computing includes neuromorphic computing, quantum computing, all the um, 
photonic computing, ways of computing where you do not use numerical uh, methods, but you really use physical quantities to represent um, uh, what you want to compute, like the brain does. Um, and also he, another activity was um, that he helped establish the NICE conference series, one of the few international gatherings of researchers interested in neuromorphic hardware, really a conference dedicated to neuromorphic hardware. Very tragically, this conference was planned to be for the first time in, uh, in uh, Europe, um, 2019, and he died before that. And in addition, COVID-19 shifted this conference to the virtual space, unfortunately. But a lot of you might have visited the conference and I think it was still a big success. And also this was only possible due to Carl Heinz's work before. <clears throat> So all these achievements are still helping the idea of neuromorphic engineering and are motivating our students, our young people to choose this research uh, for their careers. And I think this fact, this was especially important for Collins um, to teach the students um, and to have students interesting in this um, great field of research. So thank you that, uh, for this um, special recognition. Yeah, Wonderful, and, and Johannes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. That's you know, very important uh, for the field to have leadership. And uh, we really appreciate that uh, he was, uh, had this enormous impact on, on the formation. And, and now we're very excited to hear that it's being continued in Europe. So um, I see Bjorn there. Hi, Bjorn. Long, also a longtime collaborator with uh, Karl Heinz and frequent attendant in Kapakachia. I have very good memories of the fantastic students of Carl Heinz group and the, and the brain scales and H3P group coming to Kapakachia in the, in the uh, disco area underneath the hotel pool where it always smelled so moldy, but where we had so much fun. Is there anybody else from that group here or any of Carl Heinz family with us? They might be just watching the live stream. Yes, then um, they know about this event and I hope they are only the last few. Fantastic, okay. Um, any words from uh, Kynan or Rodney here at this point? Otherwise I'll go ahead with a final thing having to do with the award and we'll be just go on ahead. time. Go ahead, Toby. Okay, so um, thank you, Terry, very much for that. So you guys have all seen the, if you've taken a look at the mahalprize.org site and you've looked at the previous awards, and you've seen they've gone to things like the um, IBM True North and the RPG group for their fantastic work over five years or so by five or six people on event-based vision. And on the Astro site, this mobile observatory built in Western Sydney University by Greg Cohen, Andre von Scheich and their group. These are big engineering projects. It, it looks like it's impossible for a single person to carry off and have any chance of competing for the prize. And it's not the kind of thing, Misha would not have got this prize. So that's not the kind of prize we want. We want a prize also in this domain that Misha could have gotten. And so that's why we established a new prize thanks to funding also from Neurotech, which will be called the, um, I hope you guys can see the slide. I'm having a problem with dimming. What should we call the, can you still see this? Yes. Yeah, it's the Mahaud Early Career Award or Mecca. And the idea of the Mecca is that it recognized an exceptionally talented student as Misha Mahaud was. So I'm going to tell you about this, and then you can look on the details on the website. So first of all, who is the value of the prize will be $2,000, which will pay for travel, as well as guaranteed participation, physical participation in one of the Kapokacha or Telluride Neuromorphic Engineering workshops. The eligibility is for individuals. This is really aimed at individual master students, PhD doctoral students, or postdocs within a year of the PhD degree award. So you can get your PhD and still send the application submit your, your application within a year of your PhD and what to submit. You just have to su submit a description of any type of hardware, software, or algorithm. Um, you, of course, you're encouraged to include links to other stuff, but it, the whole thing has to be a readable, short two-page description. Um, the submission is a project description of maximum two pages. See the website for details. When you should submit, submission is always open. The MECA deadline is the same as for the Misha Mahal Prize, 31st of October. So you still have uh, several months for this 
coming year's award to submit for it. The evaluation of these submissions will not be by the same jury. The MECA submissions will be evaluated by a two-person jury, a prominent mid-career scientist, together with a consensus building chair using the same criteria as the Misha Mahal Prize. And you can look on the website what those criteria are. And this year's jury and chair will be Munya Eliali from JHU and Emre Nefchi, who you guys probably know from the workshop this year, uh, who's gonna be the upcoming um, chair of the Telluride uh, workshop, and Andre von Scheich, who will coordinate, who will build a consensus among the jury. So we greatly look forward to your submissions. Um, you can resubmit as long as you're within a year of your uh, PhD award. And we hope to get lots of stuff from you guys. And with that, I think that's it, unless there are some final so, words. Yeah, so, Toby, I'd like to have a small coda, if I could, if you yes. could give me the screen. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so uh, Toby mentioned uh, that this is uh, July 4th weekend here in the United States. And uh, you know, for th those who are uh, from elsewhere probably don't appreciate that uh, this, th there's a tradition, a small town tradition of having a parade. <laughs> and uh, and, and we, if, because of the fact that the workshop was co-located and it overlapped uh, on July 4th, uh, we, uh, the, the workshop uh, would traditionally put on a display uh, and you have to understand that, you know, who are the other uh, participants in these uh, uh, parades? Well, there were horses and the, there were cowgirls and there were, uh, you know, people, you know, the, the local residents. And it, it, it was really great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and this is the main drag here where the, the, the parade goes down. And, and, and by the way, who, who, the General Schwarzkopf, you know, for the first Gulf War. Uh, was was presiding over the uh, the event, and so it was kind. Of, and, and there would be, always be these jets that would go over, kind of uh, rumble the the, the valley. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to play a video, and, and to give people a sense of you know what it was like to actually be in the parade, and you'll you'll hear the commentator actually uh, talk about us. So here it is. Here here's the uh, parade, and here's the. Uh, I think this is General Shirts cough up here. Uh, this is the. Uh, the, the the county courthouse. Uh, so here here comes the uh, the, the Nuremarks. Waves coming out of this rain trust. Some of the most gifted young scientists in America and from around the world attend the Telluride assembly every summer, and the Nuremarks never never disappoint at the Fourth of July parade. No idea what's coming on. I kind of got a sneaking suspicion. As usual, the Neuromarks are going to take over the show here momentarily. Ladies and gentlemen. It's Ania there. That's Ania. Okay, well, I think that you got a flavor of it. By the way, if you're wondering what the hats were that people are wearing, I think, I think those were meant to be dendritic trees made out of aluminum foil. <laughs> they're not tin hats, you know, they were, <laughs> they're meant to give a sense for uh, neurons. And of course, you know, the crowd had no concept of what the hats meant or what the, uh, the new morph actually did, but, but they really welcomed us with open arms and we won many prizes. Uh, I don't know, uh, Chi-Chi or Toby, can you, can you describe uh, the successes we've had in Telluride? Uh, <laughs> I think we, we win a prize almost every year. Not, not necessarily well, the first prize, but definitely second It's a little prize. bit like a kid's ice skating contest. You know, it's hard to not get a third prize or, <laughs> or second prize. But we've won a few first prizes and, and a whole bunch of second prizes. And once in a while, we win a first prize when we don't have real competition from, I don't know, a flatbed reggae truck or, you know, the kids prize. Yeah, but we're, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and I have to say, it's really uh, 
a bonding experience because uh, the neurowars actually put in a lot of time and effort a few days ahead. Right? Oh, no, no, no. We, we only put in about two hours effort right before the parade, like making furiously making costumes oh, and attempting no, no, to no, coordinate. No. I, I remember people planning, they had, to, they had to decide, first of all, what the theme was. I remember one year it was going oh, yeah. to be the retina and people had to, you know, they, they were going to be the cones. There was a red, green and blue people with hats, you know, little cone heads, <laughs> you know, no, that took some organizing. It wasn't just us, uh, you know. That's right. It's very collective. In March. Collective, yeah. I would say a day and a half, really, totally. Yeah, so, but, but you know, we really, uh, this is the spirit of Telluride is, I think, what we really was really special. And I, I know this Zoom meeting here is attempting to, to recreate some of that magic, but, boy, you know, I, I really miss the... Uh, what was like, you know, to be there in person, and 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 will we expect to go back in person next year? Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> if there's no, I'm gonna go. I don't way. know about you guys, but I'm going. New oh. way. Well, in fact, I think some people are going to go back this year. Isn't that right? There are some people there right now. Well, Malcolm Slaney is there right now. As a matter of fact, I have a background here that I shot, uh, you know, that he shot, um, you know, just the other day in Telluride. In fact, exactly this background, the one I have behind me now, is what he shot just two nights ago in Telluride, a beautiful rainbow, much like the one you just showed. Yeah, so, but there's no, you know, it's different. You always feel lonely when the neuromorphs are not there. Yeah, lonely. also there, right, Guido? Guido, I don't know if Guido's there. Okay, uh, we sincerely hope that as many of you as possible can join us in the next physical workshop. We still have several weeks of fun stuff to do here at the workshop. And in fact, even tonight, there's gonna be some more activities. I'll just put up the schedule just to remind everybody. Um, uh, but thank you everybody for participating in this, in this prize award and for the great presentations. Um, I think tonight the remaining items uh, is uh, and topic area meeting starting in fact in about uh, 10 minutes from now, and that will include, and also a an, uh, sensory motor integration tutorial on from Yu Hong on using this uh, video to events toolbox, and uh, that will be part of the SMI work with me, and that'll be it for today, and then I'll start, start on Monday again. We're not doing Saturday like we do in Telluride. Yeah, it's, it's six days a week there, um, but we'll start um, with regular work group meetings, so keep checking on the Slack announcements channel and the topic area meetings channel and watch the schedule because the only authoritative thing is this actual schedule that's there. It can change literally an hour before uh, you need to do something, but we'll try to let you know. Is there any other word from the organizer today? Or any questions, comment? I'll just uh, add that uh, Nick Hilgarg has uh, kindly offered to launch a poker game at the end of the ant workshop. So that'll be in about an hour from now, whenever it actually finishes. They'll put the link on the announcement channel. Please join in. Right. Remember it's video and voice chat. So it's a chance to um, socialize and you don't have to actually play to join the chat. Okay. The poker club dot now. Yeah, it's really nice, nice, uh, nice um, venue to play in. I've used it a lot. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, our finals. Um final presentation of the working groups will be when? Um, Friday to about, 16, yeah? Yeah, the final uh, presentations of what's been achieved will take place, I don't have it here, but it'll take place uh, at the end of two weeks, um, which will be um, uh, on Friday, July 16th, same starting time as we started today. Um, I don't think this is real work group meeting, but anyway. And then we'll have also a presentation from one of our uh, nice sponsors of the workshop, Sony AI. So if you're thinking about a job with Sony AI, this is your chance to, to hear from them. Okay. I guess that's it for today, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Have a Thank good you. weekend, guys. Or oh, and yeah, go over and play poker. Oh, Christoph is waving something. Okay. <laughs> good. Ciao. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>